I ain't doing trans jokes no more. You know what I'm going to do tonight? Tonight, I'm doing y'all handicap jokes. Testing the waters. Just seeing if y'all are still fun. Just wanted to say, whoa, <laughs> do you mean your disabled toddler is drowning? <laughs> she goes, yeah. I go, right. Well, let's... Oh, dead. <laughs> Wasted too much time being woke. So when Matt Reif, when Dave Chappelle, when any of these people claim victimhood, Ricky Gervais, yes, guys, we're all doing it to each other. It's a cycle. You cancel me and I cancel you and you cancel me and I cancel you and we're all doing it through our own values. Even when you hold people accountable, it's through your values. Like, it's a construct. We made it up. There's no objective morality. There's no even meaning to why you're on the planet. You're just making up the meaning. You're deciding to pick a bubble lens and you're saying from this perspective, this is my meaning. So this is what I'm going to carry out. Or you were born into it and you decided to continue it. So when I say I wish people would hold themselves accountable, what I'm saying is I wish people would be self-aware enough to know they didn't have to do that in the first place or why they're doing it in the first place or to have a relationship with the fact that they're doing it. So I wish to live in a world, but I know it won't happen. So of course I let go of that control. Okay, we're letting go of the idea that we have control control over it in the first place. But obviously I would like to live in a world where people can just say it out loud. Oh yeah, I did that shitty thing. I won't do it anymore. But why was it shitty? Different things are shitty to different people. Even when I say the word shitty, it's not objective. When I say you're being shitty, I'm not saying anything objective. Everything is through the perception of our lens. Everything is through like us. I think it's shitty. The reason we congregate, the reason we have societies that get along, is because we agree basically on how society should be so we could be quote less shitty. And then conflict arises because we start disagreeing on what is shitty. And that's where the conflict arises rises and then people say well your shittiness is going to bring the destruction of the world so now I have the right to kill you and it's like well okay let's talk about that. Levy says do you feel like because of social dynamics and oppression that there's a difference between feminists complaining about these alpha bros complaining though? I think within the bubbles there's always something real really happening. I think within our lives, everything is very real. Our lives are very real, but they are constructs. Racism is a construct. Sexism is a construct. Everything is created of our, out of our own ego and our own perception and our own decision of how to interact with people. We interact through trauma and dysfunction, and then we blame people. So when white men complain to my audience that I'm being racist because I sometimes make jokes about how white men, this is a white man problem, you're creating a problem. And you're also identifying with a group of white men that I'm saying are the bad kind. There are groups of people that have bad habits. All of our communities have problems. You think Arab men are perfect? You think I can't make a whole fucking special on Arab men? Every group has negative qualities because of culture, not because of your skin color, because of your culture. And your culture is not about your skin color. It's about how other people interact with your skin color, whether you're white or black or anything else. Even your race and your ethnicity and your sexism, all of it, all of it is just a relationship we're having to one another. When you don't confirm, conform and you don't look the way they want you to look, people will ostracize you. Like humans are animals. We're just like living organisms on this planet. So yes, your oppression is real. People are lying. They are hurting you. But it's also because we've we're all contributing to the system, right? I can't get people to understand like you have to start with yourself. When you're angry at the world, you're angry at yourself for wanting to control the world and for wanting it, for wanting it to be different. You need to first radically accept in a philosophy sense, the world is exactly the way it's supposed to be. It's perfect. That's step one, after, which takes a long time. Good luck. After you do that, then you decide, okay, which interaction am I gonna have in the world to evoke change in a way that's within reason? And the change has got to be something you own as your values, your morals, your perception of what's good. That's why when people say like, I just want to help people, I'm saving the world. Why? Why? Why are you doing that? Oh, because this is, why? It's for yourself. You have to own that it's for yourself. So first you accept, okay, humans are exactly the way they're supposed to be because they're exactly the way they are. Okay. Now, what part of the world do I want to change to make the world better for who? For you and people like me that's really what it's about. And then you have to ask yourself in which way you're going to do it. Are you just going to be a better neighbor? Are you just going to drive better? Are you going to be a politician? Maybe volunteer? Maybe be an actor and have influence? Are you going to be a YouTuber? Are you actually not going to do anything in particular? You're just going to kind of accept it for what it is and, and wing it. It's all about you. This is about you. It always was. Whether you're a comedian feeling like you're getting canceled by somebody else, you're the thing that's hurting somebody else. The way Dave Chappelle feels is the way somebody else feels about Dave Chappelle. The way we feel about each other is the way somebody else feels about us. I am someone's bad guy. I am someone's villain. I accept it. I understand. When you have a difference of values, you are somebody's villain. So instead, again, of feeling like the whole world is against you, you have to understand the whole world is against itself. You're just a part of that world. So it feels like they're against you, like it's personal. But it's worse than that. It's not even personal. 
And then when it is specifically personal, it's still about them. Somebody targeted and chose you for their own ego. It's not even about you at the end of the day. Which almost hurts a little bit. Damn, if you're going to serial kill me, at least make it about me. Nah, it's not even about you. It's about them and their desire to be cruel to you, which has nothing to even do with you. Because think about it. Would you ever torture somebody? Would you ever hurt somebody? Truly, would you ever really want to do that? Then think about the people who are willing to do it. Those people, it's about them. When you do something, it's about you. That's why I don't believe in altruism. If you do something good or bad, it's about you. And it's not, you're not bad, dude. You're just living your life, okay? It's gotta be exactly the way it is because we are exactly the way we are. I'm imperfect, you're imperfect. And all we can do in my mind is harm reduce. That's it, baby. That's it, okay? Harm reduce. Move forward, harm reduce. Be kind to each other, harm reduce. Be kind to each other, harm reduce. That's it. Otherwise, like, I, I ain't fucking Jesus like little Nas is, you know? Ah, the Netflix comedy special. Since 2013, a comedian, nine times out of 10, a man, unless Amy Schumer, is presented as a relatable sage, fighting against our modern times like a martyr against Hollywood, the woke liberal media industrial complex, the constraints of modern comedy and its decline. We're going to go off on and analyze the anomaly of the modern male stand-up comedian. Now, I've never really thought about comedians as a group of people, a protected group of people that need... It's a bubble. It's a very specific kind of bubble, let me tell you. But I think in our modern times, especially in our increasingly politicized modern times, the stand-up, especially male comedian, is a very interesting instance and example or microcosm of something that I see quite prevalently among us all. And this is something that I became aware of in the internet and the media's response in general to the Netflix specials of Dave Chappelle and Ricky Gervais. In short, I feel like the modern male comedian with a Netflix special is going through an identity crisis that he refuses to acknowledge as being his own crisis and instead is everybody else's problem. Of course, this isn't every comedian, but the growing politicization of comedy, specifically stand-up comedy, has really put many comedians into a bind, especially those comedians who... And remember that comedians are basically content creators, right? Like they're all content creators trying to make their own name for themselves, their own brand, their own level of fame. Bobby Lee has such a complex. He feels like he's never famous enough. And to be truthful, he is pretty, he's pretty secure in his career, but he's also not Bert Crenshire, Bert Crenshire, Bert Crenshire, Bert, Brett, Brett, Bert Crenshire, Brett, Brett. Mm. Anyways, I don't watch these people. Listen. And so there's a point where he's not the top people, um, but he is somebody, right? He is like a part in the new Sex in the City like reboot. He has his own podcast. He makes good money. Like Bobby Lee should feel secure in his relationship with his career, but it's hard when you're comparing yourself to like the top four, top five, type six, or top six. And then there's like inner, dr there's drama, right? There's Regular drama that happens just like on YouTube. Remember, everything is like high school, but with money. And it's all happening in every group. There's like hierarchies. Like, okay, look, you see the drama that's happening in my sphere around this stuff is so stupid, right? So stupid. So brain dead. Just like that, it's happening in this sphere, this bubble. And it's happening in that bubble. And it's happening in the president bubble. It's happening everywhere because humans are brain dead. They're just completely unable to face themselves and speak perfectly, myself included. Okay? Myself included, okay? I am not exempt from this, like, observation. We're just completely fucking brain dead and we're very bad at communicating. And we're so bad at, like, explaining to people our thoughts or explaining to people the nuances of our thoughts. And then we just, we're all so dumb, but we try so hard and that's why we're so good because we're trying so hard, but we're all so dumb, you know? And it's just gonna continue going and going and going and going and going. Anytime you get a group of people together, there's this comparison and comparison is the thief of joy, but yet it happens. So you have to meditate and be introspective and be thoughtful and practice a philosophy of sense, a lifestyle that coincides with your values. And so again, 
when I see these comedians and they're being raunchy and they're trying to piss people off and the question is what part of their values is telling them this is what we should do? And that's the question. So when I see Matt Reif, I'm like, what part of your values and not your trauma is telling you to do this? I think he is completely motivated by his trauma. Like Whitney Cummings, like other people like Bobby Lee, they are completely motivated by their traumas and they're willing to lie for their fame. Bobby Lee recently had to come out and start sharing like all, like a lot of his stories were allegedly fake. A lot of like comedians all looked at each other like whose story is fake? There is a group of comedians that have only fake stories in their sticks, their sticks, right? I grew up with like uh, Fuhrer Rednick, blah, blah, blah. Like, okay, th- it's not the same as like what we're doing and seeing here with Dave Chappelle and Ricky Gervais. They're trying to, they're trying to sell authenticity. So remember that as we're watching, like these people are just people. They go home and bitch about the same things. Oh, those blue haired feminists on Twitter. I'm so annoyed with them. Oh, the trans people. I'm so annoyed with them. Oh, the liberal. I'm so annoyed with them. Oh, the Republicans. I'm so annoyed with them. Everyone goes home and just bitches to their family like everybody else. The stereotypical boogeyman of the old man, the white man, or simply the man with not enough ethnic spice. Almost all viral comedy today is about looks. And by looks, I specifically mean identity group looks. If you're Asian American, African American, a butch lesbian, or God forbid a boy, this is your time to shine. Most stand-up comedians who find their renown via this paradigm are pretty content with it. But some have resisted and instead want to be associated with a different identity group look. Take for instance... I'm sorry, before she gets into it, Matt Reif is a perfect example of somebody who physically changed his looks, got things done in order to fit better into a bubble and wasn't excited about the bubble he put himself into and wanted to switch to a different bubble. This man has been in a lot of bubbles. What was that show he was on with Timothy Tonsharansu and Nick Cannon? That was where Matt Reif got it. That's where he was for a long time with his bad teeth and bad jaw. The essence of comedian Matt Reif's Netflix special is that he hates young people because he's not like other young people. That is, he does not want to be associated with the stereotype of today's young people, which he just- He's a cool kid. He's not like those other kids. He's a cool kid. Miss Fishy says, oh wait, he got plastic surgery. Matt Reif says he didn't get plastic surgery. But all evidence points to the contrary. He definitely got veneers. Seems to take as given. That is young people as overly sensitive, as politically correct, as weak, as poor, as feminized. I hate young people too. And there's really no middle ground. I hate young people and I, I fucking love old people. I feel like it's a younger generational thing too, right? The crystals and astrology and all that. Which makes it's like a specific bubble. Don't you love it? You know what tells you know what tells on people the most is what they complain about. Why would you even know what that was unless you were in the bubble? Dummy. Think about it. If I asked my farm brother, like, hey, do you know about this? He'd be like, What? My brother sticks to his bubble, hangs out with his people. He don't know nothing about nothing. You only know it exists because you're there, dummy. Like you might not be in it, like you might not identify with it, but you're definitely losing sleep over it, dummy. Like, that's what's so fucking funny. Why do you even know this bubble exists? There's 8 billion people on the planet. Why do you even know about the astrology girlies? Leave them alone. I could tell he's a Pisces. I'm just kidding. I don't know what that means. I just made that up. I'm just kidding. I'm not an astrology girly, but you better leave them alone anyways. Why do you even know what they are? Why are they on your timeline? Why is the algorithm feeding it to you? Huh? You leave them alone, bitch. Sense. I hate young people, dude. I really do. Oh. Anybody, anybody my age or younger, you don't have anything to offer me, man. I just, I, you're so rude. Young people are so disrespectful even when they're not trying to be. Matt Reif wishes that his entire audience was 65 years and up. He reached out to Jordan Peterson in order to partake in a circle jerk of the oppressed contrarian male comedian fighting against the online leftist hater. Okay, so now you're a comedian and you got canceled for a domestic assault <laughs> joke. <laughs> I love when bitches hit their wives. Literally, that's what I'm saying. And then in response to that, instead of apologizing like a good boy, you put up a joke ad site about special needs helmets to protect the people who are offended by you. And now- I, wow, some good stuff right there, kids. This man, Martin Luther King Jr. (laughs) 
Move over, Jonathan Majors. Oh, to get yourself out of trouble, you're going to come on my podcast. <laughs> I never That's said your that. Plan. I was hoping it would make things way worse. I'm hoping yeah. we can drop. He's so unique, Fishy says. He is so, I have never met a white man like this. I'm so jealous I married my white man. I should have married this one. I've never met a white man like this. So sure of himself, so positive, so insecure enough to get plastic surgery and then complain that women want to fuck him. I've just never, what a unique, what a unique soul. Just so unique as a consciousness, this man right here. No, but seriously, first of all, I take that back. I'm very happy I married my husband. Gross. I shouldn't have even joked about that. I'm so sorry. Ugh. Listen, obviously, I went through this stage as well in my early 20s. I also thought I was too cool for people my age, even though everyone around me was my age. I also thought, because I was reading all the time, that I was a little bit better than people. You're going to grow out of it. He's an American hero. Matt Reif is an American hero drive sales to that very real website about the helmets yes anyways congratulations oh my god stop thompson says seems like matt rife is just a young pick me for boomers bro literally bro literally i thought i thought the joke was funny Thank risky you. And funny. And I thought your response was dead on. Not that Jordan Peterson is a comedian, but his antics, especially on X, formerly known as Twitter, have been very comedic. And yet, at the very same time, this identity crisis or cries from the male stand-up comedian to be understood for who he is and not who he ought to be are ignored. Vulture critic Catherine Van Arendonk lists 11 signs you're watching an edgy comedy special. In this entire piece, listing off these 11 signs there is absolutely no introspection no curiosity what's introspection kid so ever as to why edgy humor is blowing up at the moment nor is there any interest beyond well it's not blowing up y'all really did not grow up with comedy specials like don't get me wrong we just said like Richard Pryor in my comment section, like edgy comedy is not new. It's not blowing up. It's just like what people want because we go in. Um, this is why I say like life is in linear. Time is in linear. Our experiences are in linear. They go in like waves and they come back around. So it's like, you know how everyone's like people are becoming more conservative. That's normal too. What will be in the future in like 100 years, our kids, kids, kids will have conversations about how everyone is so conservative and we need to be progressive. How everyone's too progressive and we need to be conservative. The life is like this. Like, it's not linear. So this idea of like, oh, once we have women's rights, we'll always have women's rights. I don't think that. Oh, slavery's, slavery's not anymore. Slavery's always, first of all, there's always slavery in the world. I don't know why people think there's no slavery in the world. But like, there's always going to be a cycle of whatever's new because humans are just evolving animals and we just repeat cycles, right? Throughout history, there's always different variations of what people are doing right now. And it's only in the bubbles you're in. We're only talking about Western comedians, right? We're only talking about specific people. We're only talking about people with access to the internet. We're talking about people who have access to Netflix. We're only talking about communities that have access to these specific people. Everyone goes through cycles and everyone's gonna have their new edgy person, their new thing, their new, you know, every, that's why if you guys wanna get famous, if you wanna be the next thing, you can be. That's why Jonathan Majors was kind of crazy, but kind of like he could have been the next something. That's the question, do you want to be and why do you wanna get there? You can always be the next something. You know what I mean? What is that saying? Morgan Freeman became famous or became an actor in his 60s or whatever. You can always become the next thing. Vera Wang became a designer in her 50s. Like you can just become the next thing. There is nothing original and this has all been done before. The dominant liberal media has- Just remember that nobody knew who Jordan Peterson was 20 years ago, except in that bubble. Now he's literally everywhere. He's global. He's done the exact same thing. Andrew Tate just blew up out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Like with Ricky Gervais Armageddon, reducing it to being nothing more than 4chan jokes, which went out of fashion in 2014. Netflix comedy specials once boosted talent. Now they platform out of touch men, boasts another. I, I think this is like such a like a jealousy thing or like an envious thing or some sort of like Netflix comedy specials are boost like what comedy specials used to boost talent. No, they used to boost talent in the bubble. Now they platform out of touch men. Well, the men have audiences. And also to those people, they're talented. I don't like this narrative right here. It pisses me off a little bit because it's like, why be upset about who's popular? It's a reflection of the culture. Or, you know, be upset if you want to change that culture. You know what I mean? But again, like, 
what are, what conversations are we really having here? Like people who write these kinds of opinions do kind of like girl, just it girl, relax. That's why I say my mom and dad were so good for not raising us to be jealous, envious people. Jealousy and envy is really like, I don't have time for it. I don't care what other people are doing. What I care about is what I'm doing. And if you are talented and you think you deserve a spot, make a spot for yourself. Because it's the only way life works. Life is very unfair. It is only a collection of all of our actions mixed together. That is what life is opinion piece and all this back and forth between different identity groups and interest groups which does nothing quite frankly makes me think what is the point of modern stand-up comedy today geo says with lines like oops i can't say that anymore or else i'll get canceled god damn find a new shake well that's the thing every new generation will have a new cancellation right every new generation will have a new we're gonna get canceled for that right like every it's not we're not doing anything new we're not. Nothing about your life is original. You've never had an original thought or an original experience. Hear me out, girls. You have never had an original thought or an original experience. And that's okay. Beautiful. Great. Love it. Still live in my life. You are the character in... So when you look at history and you think about like, oh, who are these people? They're you. And you're just living a different time of that history. That sounds so woo-woo. You know, we all replace each other. Oh, that still sounds too woo-woo. I'm trying to make a literal, like I'm trying to make a little argument, but it all sounds woo-woo. Like quite literally, when I think about history and I think about who we remember, who we write books about, I think about who's everyone else. We're most likely the everyone else. No one's going to write a book about me. Thank God. Like no one's going to remember me. I'm just going to be everyone else. And it's sort of amazing think about what a benefit it is just to be the people nobody even cares about it's kind of nice but no one's having an original thought no one's going through an original thing my levels nothing everything we all everything's just sure even falling in love and finding the love of my life and my soulmate and the thing they write about in storybooks that you always wanted as a child cool other people have that other people have that the great news is that other people have that too cool and we can all just live our lives so this whole shtick of like, oh, I can't say that. I'll get canceled. Yeah, everyone has gone through that. Every generation of people has had that happen. You're not special. These comedians think they're special. Dave Chappelle thinks he's fighting the man. People think people, Matt Rife's like, I'm fighting the man. All these people are like, I'm going through something. You're going through the same thing everyone went through before. Boring. But it's their whole life because that's the bubble, which is fine. But it's a choice to be there. It's a choice to be in the bubble. I'm telling you, they're not smart people. Feminists, they're not as smart as they're coming. I love Bill Burr. I will watch Bill Burr stuff. But even Bill Burr, I love his bubble. But it's a it's a Bill Burr bubble. Enough, I'm telling you, someday, <laughs> there's going to be... By the way, this is going to be my last show ever by the time this fucking thing comes out. I'm sure everybody has their own different answers for this, but my generic answer, which I think is quite universally the answer that people would somewhat give, is that the point of comedy is to make us uncomfortable in the awareness that something which ought never to make us laugh in everyday life has brought us to fits of hysterics. It's that one medium in which not just a comedian, but an audience can be entirely honest and vulnerable with itself and at the end of it feel quite good. It's that one medium where the atrocities, the heartbreaks and the abominations of the human condition can be reckoned with in a very unique way. They can be questioned and laughed at without real consequence or real judgment. Which museum? I love that you won't say where you work. Oh, the Holocaust Museum. What's, he just said, what's sadder than that? Oh, that, okay, I don't think that's sadder than the. <laughs> oh my God, that is not, let's weigh them out. 1,500 or 6 million. Uh, 
another inadvertent outcome and consequence of comedy has been its demonstration in being able to bring together enemies in appreciating the underlying absurdities of the battles that they whinge and whine over beyond the comedy show. I would say that comedy has systematically shown itself capable of doing this, even in the most divisive of settings. Take comedian Trevor Noah before he achieved worldwide fame beyond South Africa. Trevor Noah exemplifies something that the current stand-up zeitgeist has largely abandoned. The ability to punch up wittily and to punch down attentively. In this, Trevor Noah was incredibly mm. successful in neutralizing feelings of offense among some of the world's most racialized and racially divided people in the modern world. And the very simple reason why he was so successful in doing this is because he was willing to observe us and he was willing and wanted to understand us. His shows were about his audience and the many contradictions and complexities which they embodied. And in his shows being about his audience, they weren't about him. I think a very good example of this is Trevor Noah's relaying of a very heartbreaking and very personal tragic event that happened in his life. Mr. Trevor Noah. Trevor, thanks for joining us. Oh, wow. We're Story. now learning about a terrible tragedy in Trevor Noah's life. His mother was shot in the face by her husband six years ago. The revelation was made today by the website Daily Mail Online. How stepfather of new Daily Show host Trevor Noah tried to hunt him down. In his bit, Trevor is very skillful in making this about his audience and not about him. He does this through his emphasis on the reactions and the things happening with other characters in the story and the event of going to the hospital after his mother has been shot. He builds mm. a very convincing story that is relatable, especially to South Africans. I get to the traffic lights, the robot is red, and I just let it out. It just comes out. Yeah, yeah. No, no, don't watch my window. No, no. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, yeah. He builds up characters that are relatable, such as his little brother. My brother's standing there at the emergency section. I see him outside. He's just standing like nothing happened, looking around. around I go, Isaac, Isaac, what happened? He's like, Mom, she's coming shot. She's inside. So I'm like, okay, are you okay? He's like, Mom was shot, not me. <laughs> No, that's not what I'm saying, you, you idiot. Whatever, I'm coming back. So I run inside. Our encounters with doctors. And just by the way, doctors are not as good looking as they are on those TV shows, eh? <laughs> No, like they set the bar really high because I was shocked. I ran and I was like, what the hell's... <laughs> sorry, sorry, that was inappropriate. What's happening here, guys? They're like, sorry, you need to leave. I said I was sorry. Come on, what's, this is what's happening. He's even capable of making a story about a lack of medical aid funny and, of course, relatable. She's like, okay, Mr. Noah, um, your mom's just been stabilized and we, we, we're going to have to start thinking about surgery. She's been shot in the head and she's been shot in the lower buttocks region. Um, so um, this, is, this is a very serious thing. I'm like, yes, it is. Okay, so what's happening? Well, we just found out that she doesn't have medical aid. So what? She says, yeah, she doesn't have medical aid. Now, my mom always had medical aid, always. But now it turns out she canceled it a few years ago. I didn't know this. She oh, canceled no. it because she never gets sick. You know those people? I just never get sick. I never get sick, Trevor. I never, ever, ever get sick. I don't know why I have this. I never get sick. Yes, but you didn't think of bullets. <laughs> Throughout this bit, it didn't feel like this was wow. about Trevor. It didn't feel like this was about a woe is me. It felt like a woe is all of us. Clearly, everybody in the audience was not just invested in this story, but a part of it, a part of these characters and being able to recognize these characters and being able to recognize the everyday goings on and life of a South African in this sense, in this very unique, personal and tragic story. In short, there was a fine line and is a fine line between woe is me and woe is everybody. And I do think that there is a very fine line between the two and that it can be quite difficult to distinguish or see it. But I think for me, the way that I have mostly seen it play out or not is in unscripted crowd work. Unscripted crowd work is when a comedian I do like crowd work. I do watch those on TikTok. I do like the crowd work stuff. I think that stuff is better than the specials has to, on the spot, analyze and understand their audience. Jessica Kearson is arguably one of the best at doing this right now. And this unwillingness to understand Ugh, an audience. I hate his face. I hate his face. I don't like it. I hate it. I hate his face.
audience is something that is exemplified by the Netflix comedy special as of late. The special is all about the comedian demonstrating an unwillingness or a disinterest in using his comedy to try and understand those who are not him. That is trying to understand the many complexities and contradictions of his audience. Instead, it is his identity crisis which is the essence of the special. And the only people who can resonate with his special are those going through a similar identity crisis to him. That is the anti-woke, older generations, a particular demographic of men who don't understand the world which they happen to live in now, and understandably the rapid pace at which everything is changing. What I gather from Matt Reif is that his identity crisis and desire to be picked by his fellow <laughs> men she calling him a pick me is so central to him that there is clearly no curiosity nor interest in his audience mm -hmm. i would say that this is very interesting but also very clear when looking at the evolution of matt rice response to Ooh. his predominantly female audience this evolution has happened in a very short span of time so who knows where it will land this year but it is clear that initially he was somewhat perplexed and also somewhat suspicious but at the same time relatively understandable standing and very, I would say, self-aware and quite humble in response to his infamy or his fame with his female audience. But you get, you, you have a full female audience too, mostly, right? So yeah, it's, it's, are you ever like, it's slowly starting to even out a little bit, like yeah. around, the, around like uh, August, September of last year, when things started like to kind of pop off, it was like 90% women, 10% guys. Now mm -hmm. we're closer to probably a at least like a 70. Hey, 54% of women are subscribed to me. Girls, are we gonna let the boys beat us, girls? You better subscribe. You know, there's like 10% of you that are watching me and aren't subscribed. Let's go. Subscribe so we can beat the boys. But also, boys, you should subscribe so you can beat the girls. Boys and girls compete. Everybody subscribe and who will win, boys or girls? That's the question. 25, 25, I would yeah. say. It's getting a little bit That's better. Good. Yeah. You but I'm also but I'm also so base. thankful for having a female fan base because no nobody supports harder than yeah. female fan bases. Absolutely. Like if they believe in you, like they will they will help push They'll you. They'll kill for you. Yeah, and yeah. I love that. And it has very quickly and rapidly evolved to one of quite direct hostility toward this female fan base. Dude. My favorite thing is to watch the audience throughout my show because it's all the same. It's all it's predominantly women. Mm -hmm. And then boyfriends who wasn't who weren't gonna let their yeah, girls come like, alone, right? Yeah. So every every guy's like this at the beginning of every show. Mm -hmm. Every girlfriend's like this, and then about twenty minutes in, every girlfriend is like, yeah. And every boyfriend is like, yeah. All right, I actually yeah. I actually fuck with what he's talking about. Yeah. I'm like, dude, just give it a chance. I think we have very different fan bases. <laughs> I'll trade you. I'll Bro, trade you. I have Why is it that modern women love me when they seemingly hate all men? How can I either relate to or poke fun at the hypocrisy of these women objectifying me as they have probably been objectified their entire lives? How can I take advantage of this rare opportunity as a male comedian with a majority female audience? How can I actually talk with humor about being misunderstood? But in essence, there's nothing of that in Interest. There's no curiosity in the comedy of Matt Rife. Same for you guys with guys. Like if you have guy fans, straight guy fans, mm. you have to wonder a little bit: Do they like me because of what I'm talking about and the content I'm creating, or that they do yeah. they just want to fuck me? Absolutely. So it's like whenever I have a guy fan, I know it's genuine. Like they they appreciate my comedy. They don't have to question it at all. Yeah. And that to me, like, it, it it feeds. The um. What if they're gay, dummy? What if they're pansexual, dummy? The I guess confidence. And that you and need you to be able to perform. And this is a point that I find very interesting. He sort of lumps together all of Bruh. of his female fan base and lumps together all of his male fan base. How on earth does he know that the males who come to see him are genuine? That they are there just for him? Do they really know him? Do they What if they're gay, bro? They really know his stand-up. Can he really be so naive as to really assume the intention? Basically, if you missed the statement, he said, like, when women come to my show, basically, it's like, you know, how I look or they're like into me. When guys come to my show, it's because they like are into my comedy as if guys aren't gay.
perceptions of his male audience relative to his female audience with such certainty. I have come across numerous comments of women who genuinely like him, genuinely like his comedy, who are genuinely there because they are members of his audience. And to show such a clear lack of interest in the plethora of females who are watching you is quite telling, I think, of this generic thing that I see in stand-up comedy today, which is this lack of an interest in an audience that can't... Yeah, yeah. What if they're asexual overlord? Great point. ...neatly be put into a box, an identity box mm. that one can easily define without getting too close or really showing exertion and effort in trying to understand and actually read a room. And I think this is where the current cohort of anti-woke comedians fall short. They claim that their goal is to save stand-up comedy when all their really people who white knight people who put themselves as the hero people who say they're gonna save the world save anybody you're not the avatar sit down okay you're not the fucking avatar can't even want to do it either he was wiser than you i'm gonna save stand-up comedy i'm gonna save it myself me no one's gonna remember you when you die bruh and even if they do who cares nobody even cares bro can you imagine i'm gonna save them i'm gonna do it it's me I, what did he say? What did Jonathan Major say? I already forgot. I am an important man. What did he say? I'm an important man. Is that what he said? I'm an important man. Uh, gotta save them. Uh, trying to save is themselves. And I think we can see this in these three takeaways, which I took from the respective comedy specials of... You know, Matt Rife, kind of a girl. Matt Rife, kind of a bitch, bro. Overlord says people don't think I'm funny because they want to fuck me. I don't know how he's taking that away. You know, to be honest, it's true, though. A lot of women objectified Matt Reif. That's why they were into him, because he was hot and funny. But like a woman who gets too much attention from men and feels it's only because she's pretty, not because they respect her. Matt, kind of a bitch. Like, Matt, kind of a bitch. You know what I mean? Oh, I am a great man. That's what Jonathan Major says. I am a great man. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, I just think like Matt Rife probably going through, he going through a crisis of being treated like a woman. And now, because he's a bottom bitch, he's going to go to all the men and be like, hi, daddy. <laughs> Jonathan, where would we be without men? Jordan Peterson, love that. Where would we be without all the men? You know, where would we be? It's just like, <laughs> Matt Reif, Ricky Gervais, and Dave Chappelle. By the time These men are so unfuckable. I just want to say that right now. I've never find men more unattractive when, like, pick -me's are so unattractive, bruh. Okay? Like, pick -me's are so unattractive. But more than that, it's because insecurity is unattractive. I'm just so unattracted to insecurity. You know? I'm, I could do shy. I could do a lot of things. But insecurity, bro? Ooh, wait. Mmm. You guys got to work on that. It's not cute. Insecurity is not cute. When that joke goes on Netflix... <laughs> It'll be nuanced. There'll be an underlying satirical point, our claim. Firstly, all three punch down at disabled people. Now, as somebody who likes all kinds of comedy, and I mean all kinds of comedy, there is, quite frankly, in terms of what can make me laugh, nothing off limits. I have a very, very dark, and I mean dark, sense of humor. I can most definitely understand why people were either upset about this or didn't get this. The problem with their jokes, especially, I would say, the joke of Ricky Gervais were that he wasn't able to answer the very important question of why he was punching down. And there's many ways that you can answer this why. I would say that Family Guy, especially in earlier seasons, was very successful in answering the <clears throat> why when they punched down by ultimately neutralizing feelings of offense by punching up or punching at everybody. Another answer to the why is originality, which is is very difficult and understandably so. impossible, I would argue. So in a world so oversaturated with jokes that everybody has heard before. For me personally, Ricky Gervais' explanation of it's a joke and it's convinced. Wrong says, I think the hate Matt Rife gets is just silly. Comedy isn't for everyone. Nobody's upset with his comedy. They're upset with himself. I think people, especially when they're fans or viewers or they have, they think they have a parasocial relationship with you. 
I do think it's fair to be a little upset when a problem happens or when someone changes or you feel like, I think it's fair. Like I always tell people, look, look, people aren't going to stay the same forever. Some people do, some people don't. But like you, Matt Rife built an expectation of behavior and he said it within himself. People weren't just mad at Matt Rife. They were mad at the disappointment. So there, it's really a problem with themselves, right? Remember when you're mad at someone, you are just mad at yourself. Matt Rife isn't upset with his female audience. He's upset with himself. Jordan Peterson isn't mad with progressives. He's mad with himself. Like even me, when I'm mad at people, I'm not mad at them. I'm mad at myself for not radically accepting them for who they are in a philosophy sense by tricking myself into thinking I have control over anything when I know I don't, okay? Like that's why I say introspection is something you have to practice. It's a tool of practice. So when I feel upset that the world is doing something I don't like, I have to remember I have no control over this because it is what it is. Not that I can't activate or uh, wish for change. Not that I can't implore people to change. That's not the same. I don't have control if people change. I only have control over myself. So you can advocate, you can prompt, you can encourage people to change, but ultimately they still have to make that decision. And I want them to make it not because they're being bullied or coerced, but because they genuinely are having a change of heart or I need y'all to mind your business. So again, like when I'm looking at Matt Reif and he's upset, he's not really upset. He's upset with himself for being an insecure bottom bitch, okay? And I mean that very like jokingly. I know a lot of you aren't going to take that very literally, but like he is insecure. He is trying to get the adults to approve of him. He is trying to be like somebody who I respect, pick me. Because like the men or the women around him, he doesn't want their approval, right? And then the women around him were hoping that he was one of the good ones, but he's not. He's kind of a, an asshole. Matt Reif is the kind of guy that women thought was like kind of a nice person, but also hot. Because he was kind of nerdy before. Matt Reif was really nerdy looking. So when he became hot, they were kind of hoping he would be like the nice guy who's also attractive. But he's not. He's the nice guy who's bitter and he's going to bully people because of it. Which is like, fine, you can bully people. But people going to bully you back, bitch. Vincing, because I'm good at what I do, was adequate. These are all jokes, okay? <laughs> I don't even use that word in real life, the R word. Uh, you just used it, Rick. Yeah, in a joke. That's not real life, is it? I'm playing a, a role. You sounded pretty convincing. Yeah, because I'm good. But I can understand. I mean, I agree with that, right? I think, like, when you're entertaining, I think it's all pretty fine. But it depends on, like, what kind of group, what kind of audience do you have? Like, what kind of a people are you vibing with? Like, there's so many, there's so much that goes into this, right? There's so much that goes into this. Um, I don't know if people are willing to actually have that conversation, though. Because, again, on the Internet, people are so – they're bad faith because they're so miserable. They don't – like, wait, I just – I had a call about this with somebody. Because, literally, I feel like people are really bad faith on the Internet because they're – like, they just see the bad in everybody, in everything. I see the good in everything. I'm an, I've been practicing optimism for, like, four years now. So for me, I see the best in everything, even like some shitty jokes, but I also know my line and what I'm willing to tolerate. So I'm like, oh, that's pretty shitty. I don't want to watch that. But for somebody else, it's good for them. So have fun, bitch. But like, I don't like it. Right. And I do think the best of people, like I assume and I trust people to like have good intentions. I know not all people do and I'm willing to like be ready for that. But I find that most people, most, most Life finds a way. Life happens. Most people are good. Matt Reif is probably a relatively good but like shitty person. He's not probably a bad person. Most people are good. I just think he has moments of insecurity that let him be less open and compassionate. He sounds like a rebellious teenager. He sounds like he's going through it. If I'm going to be really empathetic to Matt Reif, the man needs therapy. He's severely insecure. He doesn't know what to do with his newfound looks. He's not sure how to feel about himself. He doesn't feel comfortable in his body. I'm project. I'm not projecting, but I'm uh, guessing. Okay, I'm guessing. By the way that he's acted, the things I've seen from him, he's really looking for someone, almost like a mentor to take him under his wing, take them under his wing. He's looking to Jordan Peterson. He's looking to these men. He wants to be, a, he want, he's seeking approval. And he didn't, he wasn't getting the validation he needed from his audience. And that's fine. 
seek it from somewhere else, but you don't have to destroy everything in the process. But then again, that might be his anime journey. It might be his journey, right? He might be his journey to destroy everything around him to find this newfound self. Okay. So like, that's fine. But from everything that I've seen of him, everything I know of him, like, did you guys know that there was a plastic surgery doctor? And here, I'll go find it. Hold on. Me after creating the greatest jawline ever just for my patient to get canceled right after. So he's a plastic surgery doctor, right? He skips away, blah, blah, blah. Matt Reif writes, lying about medical history is illegal, just FYI. He didn't even mention him. He didn't even mention him. He didn't even mention him. Why are you going to out yourself like that, Matt Reif? He literally outed himself, bro. That's what I'm saying. Like, are, Matt, are you okay? Do you need therapy, bro? He are the one who's lying about getting plastic surgery, bro. So why would we... You know what I'm saying? I am not convinced that Matt Rice transformation. Yeah, he's saying it's puberty, right? It's solely down to puberty alone. So he went from this to this. Let's break it down in a bit more detail and look at his face through the years and talk about the specific aspects of his features that I think have changed and had some degree of alteration. By this point, he's definitely had his teeth done. But what I want you to specifically look at is the shape of his lower face, focusing on the jawline and chin area particularly in the degree of width of his face in those two areas. Moving forward, and this photo was only taken a few years ago, you can see he still has that oval face shape and the jawline and chin don't seem overly accentuated. With how Matt looks now, I wanted to find a more natural and candid photo. And what really sticks out to me here is the projection of the cheekbone and jawline area. It's much more masculine, has more of a square shaped appearance, moving away from that oval shape we've seen in previous years. And in the professionally taken photos, you can see that accentuation of the cheekbone and jawline area as well. What mm -hmm. do you think? Puberty related changes only, or do you think he's had some extra help? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, insecure. He's upset and insecure and he doesn't know what to do. It's fine. I get it. Totally. No shame in it, bro. But that's what I mean. Okay. I don't know. The surgeon definitely knew what he was doing with that comment. Yeah, he did. And he had the right to do it. Matt didn't have to go out here and confirm it and then lie to everybody that it's puberty. You know what I mean? So again, he's insecure. He won't admit it. You know, it's weird. You know, are we sure this wasn't a joke too? No, because he deleted it and got upset. Like he got pretty upset about it. You know, it's just funny. You know what I mean? You know, a hey, hey, Geo says not do don't comment on how he looks. If he's happy, that's all that matters. Oh, we call people ugly here and we admit when we're ugly. I feel like lying to yourself about your ugliness is kind of a cope. And I don't believe in coping unless you do it temporarily as a Band-Aid. I think we're all ugly. I think all humans are ugly. And only exceptional ones aren't. But I think everyone's kind of ugly. But I think everyone's kind of beautiful. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like not coming. Like you don't have to comment on people's looks, obviously. But obviously it also coincides with the point of the video. Like Matt's looks directly are the reason he's upset with female fans because they also did harass him at shows, which is super inappropriate. So FYI, Matt being sexually harassed at his shows, super inappropriate. And I think those women should be like arrested. But like women do do that. They sexually harass people and they sexually harass it, harassed Matt at his shows. And I believe that because women are gross. So a lot of women, especially straight women, I'm sorry, I'm pointing fingers here, are disgusting around men. And don't get me wrong, I grew up in a culture where like I was told to touch men more openly. I was told, and I definitely, definitely did that in my younger days. To be fair, the world has changed. We don't do that anymore, okay? We ask for consent or we joke around in a manner that feels reasonable, but you still might overstep. You know, it was one thing to like overstep. I've done that so many times. Oh my God, I'm such a physical loving person, but also I understand that it might not be people's cup of tea. So when they tell you to stop, you just gotta stop. You know what I mean? But like Matt Reif like would tell women to stop and they kept going and he'd be like, hey, like he'd be uncomfortable. And the women would like grab him and touch him, which I understand is a part of a cultural bubble. So here's the nuance. But we need to reteach older generations. We're not doing that. And we have to reteach younger generations. Like even if you overstep, it's OK to correct the behavior. You're not an evil person, but you need to. OK, just like correct the behavior. You know what I mean? 
correct it. Because I, listen, I get it. Old ladies love to come up. People love to touch my hair. Okay, it's not my favorite, but they're not evil. They're just animals. And their animal brain was like, I want to touch that. And they touch it. And I'm like, okay, we're not going to touch that anymore. Okay. And then we have to have conversations around that, right? I'm all about teaching people instead of condemning people. But if there's a pattern of abuse, continuation of behavior, we've got to have boundaries or in some cases, even ultimatums. Because obviously this is the internet and I do somewhat agree that people get offended for a small thing as opposed to looking at the bigger picture. Punching up and down antics typically have to do with intrusive thoughts and the comedian typically expresses these intrusive thoughts in a humorous or entertaining way. Now, there's nothing wrong with intrusive thoughts. In fact, I think it's essential for comedians to punch at everybody and at everything because nobody is exceptional, nobody is particularly special, and everybody- True, you're all one of a kind, but no one's really that special. He is hypocritical in one way or another, and I think comedy is a good medium in which we can remind ourselves that we are all united in this human experience of, well, stupidity, arrogance, ignorance, what have you. But what I think makes such punching and expressions of intrusive thinking funny, as well as unifying, is creating a foundation on which everybody can somewhat fall back on. For instance, and again I reference Trevor Noah's comedy shows in South Africa. Watching his shows, it's apparent that before every one of his punching ups and oftentimes punching downs, he would establish a foundation on which everybody in the audience, that is everybody in South Africa, could essentially fall back on somewhat comfortably. The foundation was basically, South Africa is a unique place full of very racially conscious people, but it's home and we can all recognize not just our idiosyncratic quirks as different racialized groups, we can also find the unifying humanity in those quirks. Unlike Trevor Noah, however, the reason for these three comedians punching down at disabled people, some of them more so than others, felt almost entirely contrived. They weren't punching down at disabled people. I'll say it like this. I think, I think people have a different diversity in who and how they can love people, right? Like, how many people can you really understand? I think Trevor Noah probably understands a few more bubbles than Ricky Gervais or Dave Chappelle or any of those people. I I think that's why when you make the comedy, it comes off different because you can you can be inclusive to different groups. I think the reason certain comedy comes off the way it does, no matter who's doing it, is it just a reflection of how many bubbles they know and who they can be loving to. Trevor Noah automatically, by the way, that he was raised and birthed and traveled and his career went put him in different bubbles, whether he realizes it or not. He has so much more knowledge about the world by default. You know what I mean? So when I talk to people, um, it's like clear to me that when they think they have like a wide scope of understanding about the world, you can usually tell if they do based off of how many different bubbles they really understand deeply. And it's not very many. Even myself, I don't understand a lot of bubbles deeply but I understand more bubbles deeply than the average person, for sure. And it's because I've lived with them or talked with them or been there with them. Now, I also have strong opinions about lots of bubbles, right? But I know truly non-binary people that I think are legit and real and valid. I know trans people that are living the most authentic and beautiful lives. I know black people that are being persecuted by the system in a way that is so obviously real. I know people who are white and poor and struggling and need fucking help and no one's helping them. I know people of all kinds of creeds and backgrounds and lived experiences that are actually going through a truly lived and nuanced experience, but their their struggles get polarized and characterized by even their own communities. People don't know how to fight for themselves. People are nuanced and complicated and layered and yet so simple. Like human, humans are so simple, but within that simplicity, the moment we interact with each other, it becomes very complicated. Within ourselves, we're so simple, 
But the moment we have to defend ourselves against other people, you know, qualify or justify our allowance in existence, the moment we actually have to make an argument of why we even think we should exist in the first place, which by the way, as a queer person, is your recent lived experience. Coming up with reasons why you think you have the right to exist is a common narrative that queer people have to do. Why do you guys think I have borderline? I've had to live my whole childhood and adolescence trying to figure out, do I have the right to exist at an eight years old age, like a child's age? While other children were just enjoying Saturday morning cartoons, I was asking myself if I had the right to exist because the bubble I was born into said I didn't. So again, like when we talk about lived experiences, right? So it's interesting when we're having these conversations, right? Like we're asking ourselves, like, what do we really know about the world and how do we relate to people? So these comedians, I think it shows in their work. It shows in their ability to say, oh, I can see that perspective. And also when you interact with a lot of good or bad people, you really know like the different kinds of bad, the different kinds of good. Who's the person that's really going to fuck you over? And who's the person that's going to somewhat fuck you over, right? Like sometimes people ask, like, why am I lenient on certain people but not others? It's because the level of harm they produce is actually less but it could look like more. Jonathan Majors with his nice quiet voice and his handsome face and his good demeanor and his nice suit is going to cause you a lot more harm than somebody else. But somebody else who's loud and boisterous and obnoxious might look like somebody who's going to cause more harm. Depends on how we define harm. It depends on how we define more or less. You know, so when we're all having these conversations and deciding who to interact with, You know, are you dating the sweet emo boy that actually just needs someone to love him and cuts himself in the shower, but actually wants to be loved and actually just needs the right kind of therapy? Are you dating the emo boy who claims he's self-harming, but he's actually going to harm you? It's like, okay, are you dating the girl who says like she's not in it for your money? She's authentic and beautiful and actually doesn't want a penny of your money. Or is she going to secretly posing you slowly for your millions of dollars? Which one are you dealing with? Okay, are you dating the nice gamer boy who actually cares about your feelings and he's actually going to like be a great partner? Are you dating the gamer boy that's going to chronically ditch you for eight hours a day to play Boulder's Gate and then another eight hours a day to play League and then another eight hours, you know what I mean? Who are you actually dating? Who are you with? Who are you interacting with? Who's this person at the store? Are you in the store dealing with a homeless person that's actually pretty chill and you guys are going to have a good convo or the homeless person that's going to stab you or follow you to your car? Who are you dealing with today? People aren't a monolith. Not all homeless people are the same. Not all anybody is the same. Not all women are the same. Which one are you dealing with today? And which one are you? Because I've been multiples throughout my life. Which one are you? Which kind of girl are you? Which kind of guy are you? Okay? Because I'm a boy girl, right? I'm a man, but I'm a woman. And being a man woman is really confusing to a lot of people. Because they don't know how to treat you, right? And so I have to recognize that. Like I can't just do things with anybody and not have them see me as a girl. And I can't just do something with someone and not have them see me as not a boy. It's a really weird life to be in a world where like boys look at you like you're a boy, but some boys look at you like you're only a girl. And so when you interact with them, they only read your actions as if you're a woman. And then they only read your actions as if you're a boy. And I'm like, fuck, which one are you? Which one are you today? You know, SB says, are you saying you're trans? I mean, (laughs) I am the trans queen. I am the trans queen here. Okay. To say something interesting, to expose some kind of hypocrisy, to say something original or to neutralize feelings of offense by then punching up at somebody like, for instance, Donald Trump, who is known for his. That's punching down, bro punching down bro can you punch down are you punching down or up on trump (laughs) infamous clip of making fun of a disabled journalist what most definitely came across was that these three comedians were punching down at today's most protected identity group who are simultaneously very well represented on social media platforms like tiktok where they and their disabilities often take center stage Only if you're on that side of TikTok. Y'all are so telling on yourselves. Only if you're on that side of TikTok. Literally, do you remember? Who was it? Who was like, oh, I don't want to be on TikTok. Every time I'm on it, it shows me teenagers dancing. Self-report. I never see people under 25 on my feed. Almost never. I don't even know. I only watch middle-aged millennials. Everybody on my feed is literally like 
it's it's only what I want to see. The feed is so good at giving me what I want to see. And the moment I change vibes, it changes it right away. It's literally like TikTok is still so good for me. Like the moment I want to watch something else, boom. So like, okay. There was no unifying foundation on which any of these jokes landed. I could find Ricky Gervais joke adequate in what he was attempting to do, but I can definitely see why it was not adequate for everybody else. And that is most definitely where it falls short. Little Nas X. I love Little Nas X. You better leave him alone. I love him. Secondly, I noticed whilst watching these specials that both Matt Reif and Dave Chappelle decided to use Little Nas X as a punching bag of sorts. And again, both of them failed to elaborate convincingly as to why. The obvious explanation is that he embodies every woke. I love him. I love, I love him. I love him. You better leave him alone. He's so talented. He is so skilled. He's so good. He's so good. You better leave him the fuck alone, bro. You better protect this boy. You better protect this the man, this gay man. You better protect him. He's our gay icon of the year. He's so good. He's so his album is so good. He's so talented. His videos are so good. He's so him and Meg the Stallion. You better protect them, bitch. And negative stereotype that these comedians are either against. Ooh! Jesus never looked so good. But again, there is no foundation on which to fall on. There is no further explanation or rather no further exploration as into why. This of course doesn't mean that they didn't try. I would say that Dave Chappelle tried greatly more so than Matt Reif in trying to explain through an analogy of dreamers and of being a dreamer and going for your dreams this idea. But it didn't land as effectively, I don't think, as it could have. But I think its ability to land well was marred by the obvious fact that he felt like a victim and is, of course, in our modern age, going through an identity crisis. That's what I mean. Okay, so when Matt Reif, when Dave Chappelle, when any of these people claim victimhood, Ricky Gervais, yes, guys, we're all doing it to each other. It's a cycle. You cancel me and I cancel you and you cancel me and I cancel you and we're all doing it through our own values. And the point is, mind your own goddamn business, bruh. Mind your own goddamn business. And that's the problem. We're not doing that. Literally, when you cancel Dave Chappelle, you're not minding your own goddamn business. When Dave Chappelle goes to trans people, he's not minding his own goddamn business. Mind your own business, okay? No one is a monolith. No one's had an original thought. We're all just fucking people on this planet doing our thing. We're all like little animals trying to figure out our lives, okay? But literally every time y'all spend your life complaining, I'm being canceled. They're coming for me. Oh my gosh. I'm Jordan Peterson. I'm the biggest victim. What are we doing with all the men? All the men. He's like the biggest victim who's ever existed while claiming to go after the progressives who are victims. Y'all are the same. Y'all are in your fucking little bubbles, being the same kind of fucking little complainers. And I fucking hope y'all get married to each other and leave the rest of us out of it. Y'all literally spend your whole life complaining and canceling people because you're pussies, bro. You're fucking pussies. Okay, all of you, Jordan Peterson, Ricky Gervais, Dave Chappelle, pussies. Everyone is a pussy, bro. Okay, all these progressives, all these feminists complaining, pussies. Fucking grow up, but you can't because it's good content and it makes your specials work because people love you because they feel represented by you because the world is full of pussies, bro, who won't face themselves, be introspective, and I'm not even judging you for it because it's just the way it's gonna go. That's our life. That's our life. We're all just going to enjoy life here. Fucking be pussies. You know? That's it. That's our life. Congratulations, bro. Okay? What's the difference between accountability and not minding your business? Um, well, even when you hold people accountable, it's through your values. Right? Like, it's a construct. We made it up. There's no objective morality. There's no even meaning to why you're on the planet. You're just making up the meaning. You're deciding to pick a bubble lens and you're saying from this perspective, this is my meaning. So this is what I'm going to carry out. Okay. But you picked it or you were born into it and you decided to continue it. But like everything is a construct. So even when you hold people accountable, 
So when I say I wish people would hold themselves accountable, what I'm saying is I wish people would be self-aware enough to know they didn't have to do that in the first place or why they're doing it in the first place or to have a relationship with the fact that they're doing it. So I wish to live in a world, but I know it won't happen. So of course I let go of that control, right? Philosophy. Okay, we're letting go of the idea that we have control over it in the first place. But obviously I would like to live in a world where people can just say it out loud. Oh yeah, I did that shitty thing. I won't do it anymore. But why was it shitty? Oh, because like, you know, I, I could have done it this way, you know? And it's different things are shitty to different people, right? So it's a bit, again, it's always about your values. All of it's a construct. When, even when I say the word shitty, it's not objective. When I say you're being shitty, I'm not saying anything objective. Everything is through the perception of our lens. Everything is through like us. I think it's shitty. The reason we congregate, the reason we have societies that get along is because we agree basically on how society should be so we could be, quote, less shitty. And then conflict arises because we start disagreeing on what is shitty. And that's where the conflict arises. And then people say, well, your shittiness is going to bring the destruction of the world. So now I have the right to kill you. And it's like, well, OK, let's talk about that. Right. Libby says, do you feel like because of social dynamics and oppression that there's a difference between feminists complaining about these alpha bros complaining, though? Not white feminists complaining like real social issues. I think within the bubbles, there's always something real really happening. I think within our lives, everything is very real. Our lives are very real, but they are constructs. Racism is a construct. Sexism is a construct. Everything is created of our, out of our own ego and our own perception and our own decision of how to interact with people. We interact through trauma and dysfunction, and then we blame people. So when white men complain to my audience that I'm being racist, because I sometimes make jokes about how white men, this is a white man problem. You're creating a problem. And you're also identifying with a group of white men that I'm saying are the bad kind. There are groups of people that have bad habits. All of our communities have problems. You think Arab men are perfect? You think I can't make a whole fucking special on Arab men? You think they're perfect men? Every group has negative qualities because of culture, not because of your skin color because of your culture. And your culture is not about your skin color. It's about how other people interact with your skin color, whether you're white or black or anything else. Even your race and your ethnicity and your sexism, all of it, all of it is just a relationship we're having to one another. Kat Von D had the audacity to go to goth, you know, be gothic and go to a Christian church and be like, I can't believe the Christians judged me. And I'm like, do you know what you look like? When you don't confirm, conform and you don't look the way they want you to look, people will ostracize you. And like humans are animals. We're just like living organisms on this planet. So yes, your oppression is real. People are lying. They are hurting you. But it's also because we've, we're all contributing to the system, right? And that's the problem. Is like I can't get people to understand like you have to start with yourself. When you're angry at the world, you're angry at yourself for wanting to control the world and for wanting, it, for wanting it to be different. You need to first radically accept in a philosophy sense, the world is exactly the way it's supposed to be. It's perfect. Then that's step one, after, which takes a long time. Good luck. After you do that, then you decide, okay, which interaction am I going to have in the world to evoke change in a way that's within reason? And the change has got to be something you own as your values, your morals, your perception of what's good. That's why when people say like, I just want to help people, I'm saving the world. Why? 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 Why are you doing that? Oh, because this is why. It's for yourself. You have to own that it's for yourself. So first you accept, okay, humans are exactly the way they're supposed to be because they're exactly the way they are. Okay. Now, what part of the world do I want to change? To make the world better for who? For you and people like me because that's really what it's about. And then you have to ask yourself in which way you're going to do it. Are you just going to be a better neighbor? Are you just going to drive better? Are you going to be a politician? Maybe volunteer? Maybe be an actor and have influence? Are you going to be a YouTuber? Are you actually not going to do anything in particular? You're just going to kind of accept it for what it is and, and wing it. It's all about you. This is about you. It always was. But people feel pressured, even like world leaders and all these people, they're often not even doing it for themselves. They're doing it for the bubble and the construct, which is the mistake. If people really did what they wanted for themselves, I do think a majority of people would probably just want to chill. I think people feel pressure to do other things because the world pressures them to do it. 
I just think if people, and this is anecdotal, I don't know this, right? I just think if people were given accessibility to do exactly what they wanted to do with little to no shame involved, that they would probably just be really chill. Except for the ones who are like truly an anomaly within society, because within every animal kingdom, there is an anomaly of like the animal who even works outside of the reasonable expectation of behavior. Obviously, those people will exist. They're, they're so little, though. They're so small of a number I, in my head. This is all anecdotal, of course. I just think that if people were able to just be, they would mostly just chill. They'd probably just garden and meditate and play video games and create stuff. But the dilemma is, again, the the world is built off slavery. The world is built on oppression. Human beings as a species is a dominant species. It takes over. It's like a virus in not a bad way or a good way. It's just like, it's just what it is. You know, I'm not even mad about it. I'm just like, kind of like, ugh, that's kind of annoying how painful, right? But that's life itself. So again, whether you're a comedian feeling like you're getting canceled by somebody else, you're the thing that's hurting somebody else. The way Dave Chappelle feels is the way somebody else feels about Dave Chappelle. The way we feel about each other is the way somebody else feels about us. I am someone's bad guy. I am someone's villain. I accept it. I understand. When you have a difference of values, you are somebody's villain. I'm a queer person. I'm the villain of some people in religion. I'm a sex worker. I'm the villain of some, I'm in somebody's villain somewhere, right? It's just what it is. So instead, again, of feeling like the whole world is against you, you have to understand the whole world is against itself. You're just a part of that world. So it feels like they're against you, like it's personal, but it's worse than that. It's not even personal. And then when it is specifically personal, it's still about them. Somebody targeted and chose you for their own ego. It's not even about you at the end of the day. Which almost hurts a little bit. Damn, if you're going to serial kill me, at least make it about me. Nah, it's not even about you. It's about them and their desire to be cruel to you, which has nothing to even do with you. Because think about it. Would you ever torture somebody? Would you ever hurt somebody? Truly, would you ever really want to do that? Then think about the people who are willing to do it. Those people, it's about them. When you do something, it's about you. That's why I don't believe in altruism. If you do something good or bad, it's about you. And it's not, you're not bad, dude. You're just living your life, okay? It's got to be exactly the way it is because we are exactly the way we are. I'm imperfect, you're imperfect. And all we can do in my mind is harm reduce. That's it, baby. That's it, okay? Harm reduce. Move forward, harm reduce. Be kind to each other, harm reduce. Be kind to each other, harm reduce. That's it. Otherwise, like, I, I ain't fucking Jesus like little Nas is, you know. Gio says, thanks, Brittany. I have a lot to think about. Good. Me too, as usual. All right, let's get back to kidology. We're almost done. That has been at the core root of everything that everybody is criticizing Dave Chappelle for and has been for quite a few years now. People who are harassed by... So what are we going to do without the men? Sensorial minded null wits almost wow jordan i really got my feelings hurt there literally like listen to him null wits jordan is such a villain to some people he just like feels like a hurt boy to me always back down and apologize mm. and last but not least a running thread through all three of these comedy specials was that the internet is a horrible place it's a horrible place full of losers trolls and gremlins that they made their whole living off of it's wanting to cancel people because they're so miserable and unfulfilled in their own lives who do you hate come on that's the thing i don't really hate anybody i don't here's here's a very humbling experience that I've uh, sorry I guess epiphany that I've had recently the, because so many fucking people hate me for really no reason mm. and it really made me realize that like people only hate somebody they're jealous of and I've been I've been guilty of hating people and when I really sat back and thought about it, it was because I was jealous of where that well envious he means envious of where that person was not jealous but person was in their life I felt like maybe they got an opportunity that I should have gotten mm. so now that I'm doing so much better for myself I don't have that energy towards anybody. I really It's not that they're jealous. When people hate you, they they have a mistake of not recognizing that they don't like you, but it's always about them. But it's not about jealousy. 
okay? It could be about envy, but it's really about not accepting that like this person is annoying to you and you're allowed to be annoyed by them, but you're annoyed because you won't let it go, that you don't control them. You want them to change because you want to feel more comfortable around them or you like them, but they can't change. And so you can't be around them, which is a loss to you. It's about you. What's the difference? Jealousy is like, I'm afraid of losing something. I'm jealous my partner, when he talks to other women, might choose them over me. That's a loss. I'm envious. I'm envious that my partner is really good at video games. I wish I was good at video games. So one is about losing. So you have a fear. And one is about wanting something that someone else actually has, right? So again, yes, when you hate somebody, it is about you. But it's not because you're jealous. I think personally, in my opinion, it's literally because you haven't accepted that's who they are. When I get frustrated with people, I'm frustrated that they won't be the kind of person that I can talk to or be the kind of person that is comfortable to be around or that I haven't accepted they haven't changed. So that's what I think it is personally. You know what I mean? really don't. A few moments later. I fucking hate young people, dude. <laughs> I really do. Oh, I hate young people, too. Because he hates a part of himself that's young and ignorant and isn't a man. And he hates and he wants to be that man. So when he says he hates young people, it's because he hates himself for being young. He thinks less of himself for being a young person. And there's really no middle. Or something related to it. Right. Now, why I mock this argument is because I find it to be quite self-fulfilling, especially with these three comedians. Because what this argument actually just ends up being and proving is that the modern anti-woke, anti-pandering comedian can therefore fail to distinguish between two important points. The first being that his jokes simply aren't funny. And the second being people... Which is subjective. Jokes are subjective. Funny is subjective. ...for responding negatively to his jokes. Rather, what especially Matt Reif seemed to fall back on is the belief that they're too edgy, too beyond the sensitivities of the internet and the modern progressive world, that their fearless jokes are simply being misunderstood. There is... Oh, he's one of our new saviors, guys. He's so amazing. He's so unique. I've never, wow. First of his time. First of his kind, baby. Isn't, therefore, something wrong with them or their jokes. There's nothing that they have to consider, nor anything that they have to improve on. The fault doesn't lie with them. Instead, it lies with everybody else. In turning against the so-called victims of our politically correct age, these rebel comedians have inadvertently turned themselves into victims, trying at all costs to defy the odds. They are, like all victims, misunderstood, taken out of context, oppressed or censored. And so in this, they attract and they garner an audience and they cling to an audience who are ultimately like a tribe. Their comedy and stand-up becomes... One could say a bubble just as cliquey, just as politicized, just as divided and politically incorrect as that which they are seemingly fighting against. And I don't think this helps what I would definitely see as the increasing politicization of modern stand-up comedy. You're in this very unique position where you, you get objectified. Oh yeah. And people say <laughs> wild shit. Like no one feels bad for you. I'm not saying- Not a bad, single but, person. But it is a crazy thing to experience. Yeah. That I've had had my nipple bitten i've meet and greets my ass grabbed all the time women women will ask arrest them get them arrested what the fuck get them arrested in front of my pr people or the, or the meet and greet people who run all of it they'll ask like can i grab your in the photo and stuff and i'm like or uh, i'll be on stage and somebody will be like get them arrested what are we doing here get matt rife up see you know what's so fucking funny I bet these aren't even like feministy women. I bet they're straight middle-aged women. I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. I bet they're straight or feministy white women. I'm saying it right now. These aren't queer people. They're not progressives. I'm telling you right now. Okay. Like some people might jump into the bubble and like add into it. Cause okay. But I'm telling you right now, get them arrested. Okay. Hello. But like, why isn't he doing that? Why, like, it's not fat lesbians that are holding your junk, dude. Literally, what? Have cops nearby and fucking arrest them. Like, take your pants off. I'm like, imagine if Amy Schumer was up here and somebody was like, let's see, the, let's see that. Like, see you, your you 
couldn't do it. Yeah. Tell me your yeah. yeah. That is crazy, dude. That it's, is crazy. It sucks. Yeah. It's so annoying. But it's like, that's, my God. that is my price to pay for having an overwhelming fan base. But now let me be nuanced and let me empathize with the modern male stand-up community. Oh, AIM says, Brittany, I got my ass grabbed by lesbians in school, though. No, okay, listen to me. I grab people. I'm a very physical person. If the if the vibe is good, I'm if I'm okay being grabbed and stuff as long as the vibe is good. I think there's a specific type of grabbing that can occur. Let's be nuanced. There is a type of culture that is grabbing. When I go to the bar, I expect to be grabbed, especially if I'm at a gay bar. I know that's controversial, but I really need people to understand. Like I don't even know why we have bars. Now at the same time, if I go to a classy bar, I'm not expecting to get grabbed. So okay, if I'm at the club, I expect to get grabbed because like. Why are you at the club? That's why people don't want to go to the club, right? Because it's super hypersexual. If you're at a nice, a nice bar that's fancy, that'd be weird to grab you there because like we're, we're fancy people today. We don't grab people, right? Okay. <clears throat> when you're at school, when you're having social situations, there's some grabbiness that goes into it. Or I'm a playful person. I'm like, I'm like, I hit people like, <laughs> I slap people. Oh my God. Oh my God, I like, I'm a hitter. You know what I mean? Like when you're like joking with people, some people hate that shit. You know, like some people hate that shit. And fuck, like if I ever do it to you, tell me, bro. Cause like I fucking, that's me. Okay. And like, that's fucked up if you don't like it and you're not, you know, cause I'm just trying to fucking josh around, you know? Um, like when I was in Miami with ABBA, one of the reasons I loved it was cause it felt like we were cousins. And every time I would laugh, we would hit each other and we were like laughing into it. It was so fun. It was just like normal and relaxed. But I know some people wouldn't like that. And to be fair, at the height of my trauma, I hated when even old ladies touched me. In the height of my trauma, before I went to therapy, I hated when old ladies would touch me. That's tr fact. True story. Old ladies touching me would trigger me when I was in the height of my trauma. And now, obviously, that's not true. Now, again, depending on the atmosphere, it could be inappropriate or appropriate. I think when you're going to go see a public figure, and he's doing a meet and greet. It is inappropriate to want to grab his crotch. It's good they asked, I guess. But he's not a band guy. Like, okay, band people have groupies. They might want that. Gross. But they might want it. I'm not going to slut shame. But Matt Reif obviously doesn't like it. So don't do it. But also you need to have cops there. You need to set the precedent. You need to. I love that he's willing to stand up for himself. By blaming women instead of just like standing up to the women directly and actually threatening them with the law. He goes to his dad, Jordan Peterson, and goes, dad, the women touched me. And they don't even do anything about it. Did Jordan Peterson get these women arrested? Did Jordan Peterson help you not get assaulted? No. So nothing happened. Like, hello? Again, context matters. I don't want to tell the whole world not to touch. Okay. OK, I want to tell the whole world to know the context of the bubble we're in. OK, like in Arab culture, men kiss each other on the cheek when they greet each other. They're always touching each other, hugging each other, loving each other. OK. Well, you want me to tell the whole world not to do that? No, I, I don't want to tell the world not to do it, to do it. I just want you to know what bubble you're in, bro. How is the vibe? What's the what's the level of chill? What's the end? I just want people to know where you're at. What's the what's the cultural expectation? And then agree to it, not this bullshit objective fake morality everyone pretends to have like i'm so sick of it bro it's so stupid okay like you have to eventually stand up for yourself in some way that makes sense and you know it's funny if matt rife would hang out with some like progressive feminist they probably could help him do that but he decided they were the enemy which is funny because they literally are the ones who probably could have got him support for sexual assaults they probably could have given him the right kind of like defense not all feminists are great though some of the bubbles suck so it just depends on what feminist bubble you know what i mean i'm just saying there's something to be said about how to have these conversations in a more nuanced way i personally know that women have grabbed me a lot and i'm okay i'm usually it depends on the vibe some vibes i'm okay with it some vibes i'm not but i just say oh no no, no i'm not doing the grabbing thing today oh no no no, no. like i'm good bro because people culturally are different. They're going to do different things. They're going to talk to you differently. I went recently, my husband and I were doing our walk and well, it was during the summer. So it's not exactly recently. And this refugee came in from like Russia and he was touching us nonstop, just nonstop touching us, just touching me, holding my hand, 
He wasn't sexually assaulting me. He was just telling me a story and he was living on the streets and I didn't care. Like in that moment, I was just like going with it. And my partner, who doesn't even like being touched, by the way, like was allowing it to happen because we were having compassion with this man. We were hearing him out. He was telling us a story about how his family died and everything happened. And it was cool because he was speaking in Russian, but my partner knows enough of Croatian to kind of like kind of guess. And I had enough English. He had enough English to kind of guess. And we were all speaking. I was speaking English. He was speaking Russian. And my partner was speaking Croatian. And we were all trying to understand each other. Eventually, I actually lost my spoons and asked my partner if we could leave because I was getting overly like it was so like a lot. But it was such an interesting experience for the small moment it happened. But he was like touching me and touching me. And I, you know, I'm not going to sit there and be like, what are you? I know I can read the room. I know the difference. Matt Reif in his situation, it wasn't some person having an authentic experience with him who was like trying to share with him. These women were basically asking if they could sexually objectify him in a way that is incredibly inappropriate. And he has the right to stand up for himself. I wish he had had the cops there or somebody there to say, hey, no, and don't ask that of people, bro. Now, of course, some people might say, oh, ask me. I don't know. It's complicated because it's so nuanced. So again, everybody has a different lived experience and expectation of culture. Everybody has a different expectation of what should I expect from people? You're not always going to get somebody who asks you before you touch, they touch you. It's not going to be like that because they might be coming from a different part of the world. And I don't want the world to be the same. I want the world to be diverse and interesting and unique. I just want us to be able to say, oh, don't touch me and someone not take it too offensively. And also like understand that it's okay for people to put down those boundaries. Like, oh, hey, like I actually don't like being touched. You know what I mean? So it's like, again, when, we, when we're having these conversations, we need to understand that if you say something like you should always ask someone before you touch them, that sounds really nice. And I would agree with you until you run into the Russian, until you run into the old lady, until you run into the guy at the gay bar, until you run into, and then it's like, well, what about then? What about then? You know? What does that mean? So it's like, it's not about saying in what situation should we, it's about what is the situation? What is the context? You know what I mean? What is the expectation of the behavior? How do I feel safe in this environment? Even though that's why when men say, oh, if the guy was hot, you'd let him do it. Context changes everything. It's not just about hot. It's feeling safe. Science has showed us that people that are better looking are treated as safer than people that are quote, uglier looking. Right? So literally, women will let men who are attractive abuse them because of your instinct in your brain is to think that pretty people are safe. You know, and ugly people are not safe. So you have to fight that biological like uh, like part of your brain and say, wait, just because you're pretty does not mean you're safe. Right? I think it might be the, the reverse with some people. But like there is a, like a prettiness privilege that happens in the world where like people get away with things because they're pretty, right? Because that's just like we're humans. We're going to do human things and we're animals. And so we're react. So that's why you have to be introspective and say or extrospective and say, okay, wait, am I letting this person do this to me because they're pretty? Yeah, it's true, but it's bad. It's also a sign of something horrible happening at the same time. That's why I say like people are not introspective, extrospective. They're really just like moving off of sort of like what they think feels right, what they think is right, what the right action is. And that's why I say people are mostly good because they don't even know they're doing it. They don't even know why they're doing it. And then someone reads a study and goes, oh, shit, do you know that this is happening? And then you're like, oh, so then in that moment, you can change action if you have the tool to change the action. So again, Matt Reif doesn't deserve to be sexually harassed. That was never up for debate. It's too bad that he went into a group of people that I'm not sure are equipped to help him with that. But I hope the right people reach out to him and inform him of how to avoid that at his shows because women have been dealing with it forever. The women who have assaulted him are the group of women who think it's okay to do these things. Some of them are predators. Some of them aren't. And it's really hard to know the difference. Incredibly hard. Like a man who asks you for your number and like, Depending on how he does it, he could be a predator or a very good person. It's very hard to know. That's why you have to have a lived experience. You have to have knowledge at your disposal to know the difference. You know? 
comedian going through an identity crisis because I think a lot of what he brings to the table, a lot of what he expresses are very valid points. I think a very negative outcome that has arisen from this growing political polarization of stand-up comedy <laughs> is that sound bites are taken to represent the entirety of a person. Everybody talks about Matt Rife's opening joke, his domestic violence joke, which alienated, allegedly, alienated woman from his audience, as well as his jokes at the expense or punching down at disabled kids. Nobody talks about his rather compassionate and, in my opinion, very self-aware reflections on how difficult sexuality is for <laughs> women and young girls, nor about his story and reflections into... She's his source, my, Mount Rife's natural selection. His autistic nephew being a brilliant painter and artist. That's his uh, special, right? The entirety of a person, including the stand-up comedian, gets lost in a very biased translation. But there's always a but. A thing that was very, very clear in these three comedy specials is that these three comedians did exactly the same thing. That is, they reduced the entirety of groups of people mm -hmm. to sound... Bubbles, 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 bubbles. I'm so right. That's why the internet hates me. You know it's bubbles. You know it is. We're all doing the same things to each other. We're all doing the same things to each other. And you can't stop it, can you? Because you're a fucking little animal, aren't you? Like, you can't fucking stop it. You're just going to do it anyways. You're going to sit there and talk about how you're a great person. The only way you're great is through your values. You have to have values. And you're not even great to other people, but you are consistent. Look, I don't always agree with my brother's values, but I know he's consistent. And then we can have a great relationship because of that. The people with no values, excuse me, the people who aren't consistent, those are the ones I'm worried about. And there's way too many goddamn people like that because they don't even know what consistency looks like. It's an expectation of behavior that makes sense within reason. I know what my farm brother is going to do in most situations because within reason, I know what his values are and what he'd probably do. He knows what I would do. Within reason, according to my values, he could probably take a strong guess. It's when you look at a person, you're like, I have no idea what they do in this situation. Those are the scary ones, bro. Sound bites in order to cater to the particular bias of their audience. So I guess we have no winners and losers in this whole venture. Now, out of all these three specials, I, God forgive me, because I never thought I would be saying this, found Ricky Gervais Armageddon to be the most meaningful and sincere. Based on the reviews, this is most definitely not the consensual opinion. The overall point, which I gathered from Armageddon, was that no, you can't control your thoughts and no, you're not a horrible person because of that. Rather than hating yourself or others for your thoughts and opinions, as our contemporary thought police also love to do, it is actually necessary to our sanity to find the humor in the multitude of depraved, politically incorrect and vulgar thoughts which none of us are exempt from having. We are all insignificant narcissistic apes, as Gervais says. And his argument tended to rest on the assumption that every generation sees itself as one step above the apes, but that this really just is not the case. Being online has actually made me appreciate how Gen Z are actually no less racist, no less misogynistic, no less bitter, cruel, and entitled than any other generation. We are all insignificant narcissistic apes, inflated on our own egos, which we like to pretend are either doing something some good or are just not there in the first place. I really appreciated this message. I did see the sincerity and meaningfulness of this message, but in the context of a comedy special, it most definitely has to be presented delicately mm -hmm. and lightly. I would argue that Gervais resorted to merely presenting the insignificant narcissistic apes as younger generations who don't understand the world, as opposed to representing insignificant significant narcissistic apes as being everybody including his audience that's always the mistake we point the finger and blame it should be on ourselves it's on all of us myself included i am not exempt from this so when ricky gervais doesn't add himself into the mix it's like dude i hope i, I gotta watch it now 
significance. I would say that in the reviews and criticisms of Armageddon, this point was largely overlooked. I feel that way with Carlin fans. Like Carlin fans definitely sometimes feel superior to other people. You're not. You're just as dumb as everybody else. That's the point. Like we are not. Like we're just not. And that's the problem. I, I don't know how to get it through because people don't believe you because people think so highly of themselves. But bro, we're all we're all just figuring it out, my bros. Like, yes, some of us know enough about ourselves. I think you can absolutely know so much about yourself. I know so much about myself. It's disgusting. I have a very high introspection level, okay? But it doesn't mean that I'm not an idiot. It doesn't mean I'm not an idiot. Knowing yourself doesn't mean the same thing as like being very intelligent in terms of knowing things about the world or how it works or other people. And sometimes I think people really equate all those things together. Okay, it's not. But also that's why we all are flawed because we all need each other to kind of build off of each other. And then sometimes we have to radically accept that like, you know, we're all gonna vibe with who we're gonna vibe with and that's it. But people individually who don't face themselves, who don't have better relationships with themselves, they're often like the reason the team can't win. This is why I often don't look at team solutions because team solutions, it doesn't matter what generation you're in, what ethnicity you're hanging out with, what religion you're chilling with, they all have their own flaws. Drama everywhere, ego everywhere, it's everyone else, it's not us, it's not our group. Did you see the Jews building tunnels in New York? Wow, they felt pretty fucking entitled, didn't they? Humans are fucking entitled. I, I, you know, I try really hard not to be entitled to anything. I'm only grateful that I get nice things, but I'm not entitled to them. Nobody is born entitled. You only think you deserve things because you've allowed your perception to convince you of that. It's insane, but it's also very human. And it's also really reasonable. It's actually not insane. That's quite like an exaggerated. It's actually within very, it's very reasonable. It's actually very reasonable, but you know, ego's gonna ego. Exactly, Chrissy. Exactly. Ego's gonna ego. That's why you have to like meditate and keep yours in check because you are, we all got it, girl. We all got to work on that ego. We all got to do it. Because, well, nobody wants to admit that they are an insignificant narcissistic ape. <laughs> Armageddon most definitely had a tinge of the nihilist to it. Comedy, especially the more politically inclined comedy of late, is meant to leave an audience with a sense of hope. Dave Chappelle with this idea of dreamers and being dreamers and pursuing dreams. Armageddon had very little, if none of that, except one message that was quite clear in its hopefulness that of the evolution of words and their meaning over time. Gervais argued that our absurd obsession with causing offense via words or being politically correct is a null and void venture in futility. We need to just be patient. I think the hopeful message which Gervais was trying to put across was overlooked by the fact that he mm. used the example of the N-word in order to Oof. exemplify this point, it's a which hard one. just caused controversy which of course was the point in order mm. to show that people are overly sensitive nowadays especially those who are not his audience I think another point of Armageddon which was I would say lost on a lot of critics was a question posed by Gervais in arguing that jokes are not real life and that jokes are not actually real the crux of his argument is that a joke even if it causes offense is just that it's a joke it is you know i think everything is in real it just is what it is right like oh you're not a real christian you're not really married you're not really in love you're not really like in our group you're not really progressive are you you're not really my friend oh you're not really my coworker. i mean you're not really i mean what is real what does it mean to say you are really something what does it mean it's it's perception right if you think and you're perceiving you're in a relationship with someone, you're in a relationship with somebody, but you might not actually be in a relationship with somebody. And that's what's really difficult. It's like, are you though? So when like I saw Matt Reif's joke, I was like, that's not funny. But I was like, I guess it could be funny. I think if it was delivered differently, it would have been really funny. So it's not that the joke isn't funny. It's that Matt Reif isn't funny to me. 
So to me, Matt Rife isn't funny. But I think that domestic violence joke could have been funny if somebody else said it. Because that would have been, it, is, it was the delivery for me, right? So like, what is really mean? Oh, you're not really this. You're not really this. It's like you're looking for something that's concrete when everything is fluid. You're not really a man. You're not really a woman. You're not really a, it's like, well, what does that mean? It could mean, it means different things in different bubbles. So if you go into one bubble, like I remember when Mr. Girl asked me, what is a woman, what is a man? And at the time I was like, well, he's asking me like a science question. So I was like, you know, chromosomes. But if you were asking me a spirituality or a consciousness question, I would have said, oh, well, that's like asking what is a chair? You can't tell me. You know what I mean? In philosophy, there's like that. Have you guys ever heard that question? Like, can you describe what a chair is? And people go, oh, a chair is what you sit on. Well, I sit on my girlfriend's face. Is my girlfriend a chair? Okay, well, a chair is something um, you have in a house. Okay, well, I my bed's in the house. Is my bed a chair? Okay, well, a chair is something that, and you go and you go, oh, a chair has four legs. A table has four legs. Okay, a chair has, okay, you you can't actually describe exactly what a chair is because a chair could be so many things. So the idea is like when you, you ask me what is real, we're not even asking the same. We don't even agree on what real is. You know what I mean? Ooh, how long is a string? That's a good one. How long is a string? Ooh, that's a good one, Brit. That's a good one. It's like, okay, so we're not. So when, again, like what is real is a construct. What is real is our perception. What is real is what we is, is what we know through our senses, but even that knowing is, percep- is, is a perception. So again, to be loving and compassionate to people is to know how little you know and to realize they know just as little. But also everyone's having a different experience with what is good, what is valuable, what is moral, what is righteous, what is reasonable. So then the complicated part is realizing like you're going to be at fault. You're going to freak out. You're going to miss here. How many times do I miss here streams? How many times do I miss tell stories? I miss tell stories all the time because I think I remember them one way, but they're different. Dr. Kirkonda talks about how faulty our memory is and how it's only so good. And so it's really hard to rely on it or even what you're meaning to convey in the moment. Or, you know, it's all of those things. It's so complicated. But that's why if you have a good spirit, if you're really like, I can like a well-meaning, then like I can get past anything. Let's forgive it and move on. But the difference or the dilemma you run into is like if someone is too bitter or too closed off or too scared or too traumatized, you can't heal those wounds, which is why we all have to heal ourselves in order to get past all of the conflict within the world. But we can't heal ourselves because we're too busy getting wrapped up in the conflicts of the world or people are oppressing us so severely that we don't have time to think because we have to keep running. If we could heal all of ourselves, if we could just work on us, The world would be a better place, but the world doesn't give you time unless you force it to give you time. And depending on your circumstance, it might be almost impossible. And that's what sucks is if you don't have the right tool, you'll never have the time and you'll only be in survival mode for the rest of your life. And I don't mean just paying bills because we all got to pay bills, girl. I mean that sense of mode where it feels like you can never truly relax, never truly let go never truly feel safe. You always feel like it's not enough. You're never living the life you want. That feeling is because you haven't gotten the tools yet to like say no to the conflict and say yes to the self-introspection. Okay, how do I live for the joy of me? Because I don't want to hurt anyone. You don't want to hurt anyone. But the world makes me feel like I need to hurt people in order to be heard. I need to protest and yell and make comedy sketches and punch down. I need to do all these things. And then the really ideal world is if you know nobody's in their trauma, you can have funny conversations and be, oh man, when my Discord, when my Discord's popping is when we're all making funny jokes and nobody's in their trauma. But then if somebody gets triggered, no big deal. It's such a safe community. We're like, hey bro, feels like you're triggered. Oh my bad, bro. Someone takes a day off, comes back, it's chill because you're not going to get punished for getting triggered. I'm not going to make fun of you. We're not going to think less of you. We're not going to hold it against you. Mental health is real. But you're also not going to be the person who says, you need to change for me. You're going to be the person who says, 
I'm annoyed with you, but I'm annoyed with me for being annoyed at you and I'm going to go work on it. I'm like, cool. And we're all going to do that. Now it's possible because the Discord's a small space and there's only so many of us. And so we're able to do that a lot better and we know each other, but communities are large and so it's much harder. But I don't want to punish you for making a mistake and I don't want to punish you at all. I just want to move forward, but you got to do the introspection. So you've got to hold yourself accountable by having some sort of values. And then you got to be able to communicate those values to other people so other people know how to treat you and how to have boundaries with you. But you've got to be consistent with those values, which is really hard. I know how to treat X person. X person is this way. When you know a Muslim or a Jew, an Israel, uh, a Jew, an is, uh, why do I always forget Jewish? If you're Jewish, I always forget what's called. Anyways, they don't eat pork. So you know not to serve them pork. You're being a good neighbor. They're really like grateful. Like, oh my gosh, thank you. Like for considering me to go out of your way not to serve me pork. Like, thank you for inviting me to dinner and cooking something without pork. Like how thoughtful. Oh, you're with a Christian on a Friday during Lent. Oh my gosh, don't serve meat. That's so thoughtful, right? But what if you knew they were um, a Muslim or Jewish or a Catholic and you on purpose made them something with pork or on purpose made them something with meat? Well, that's pretty fucked up. Why are you doing that? Well, I don't want to have to live in their bubble and I don't want to have to adhere to their culture and I don't want to have to. Then why'd you invite them over for dinner? What? Well, I, I was trying to be a good neighbor. Well, being a good neighbor doesn't mean inviting them over for dinner that they can't eat. Being a good neighbor means inviting them over for a dinner where you can eat together as a Middle Eastern person. Let me tell you, bonding over food, bonding over a meal, that's a vibe, bro. That's a vibe. You're not going to have the vibe unless you have the good intentions going in in the first place. And I don't think a lot of people are prepared to admit that they invite a lot of people over with the intention of serving them pork when they can't eat it because they don't want to do the work, but they still want the brownie points for being a good neighbor. isn't real life, it isn't about real people, and that the only reason why a joke is so convincing when it is, is because, well, he's good at his job. Interestingly, Gervais uses the example of Anthony Hopkins playing Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs. Anthony Hopkins is not really Hannibal Lecter, and he is not really a cannibal. Although, to be fair, Martha Stewart actually broke up with her then boyfriend, Anthony Hopkins, after she watched Silence of of the lambs because in her own words or as I will paraphrase there was no way that she was going to take him to her house in Maine. According mm. to Martha she found his portrayal of Hannibal Lecter so Martha Stewart we just watched a video about her I didn't know they dated so scary that she refused to see him again. But this has become a very contentious question and reckoning as to whether a joke is real life. Ricky Gervais said today he's playing a character when he's on yes. stage. Do you agree with that? Do you buy it? No. I don't. And I mean, what's a character and what's a performance? Right? This is these people are having the argument of like, what is a friend? Are YouTubers who collab friends? I'm not going to I think this is the greatest point. I know it sounds like like it, this is the that's the same conversation they're having. Is a is a comedian a performance? Are you playing a character? Now, there's um like Sark, uh what's that guy? What's it called, guys? When you play like a satirical character? Okay, and then there's the performance. It's the same conversation. What's a friend? What's a performance? What's a character? Is Sneeko playing a character? Obviously. Is Tate playing a character? Obviously. But obviously those characters are also telling real stories. Are you guys friends? Well, kind of. Yeah, obviously we hang out. Well, are you close friends in an intimate way? Well, obviously not. We never hang out. Do you guys, do you understand? Like both of those things can be true. Sneeko and Tate are playing characters, but they're also parts of themselves are true. Me and Abba are friends and Tom Foolery are friends, but we're also never hanging out personally or intimately off the internet. Except, you know, it's, it's always work related. So again, like, yes, I'm friends with them, but I can't vouch for them through and through. I can only say they're great people from what I know, but I'm not, you know what I mean? They're, they are. I love Kyla. I love ABBA. I love all those people, but I don't know them personally. We have not talked enough. I don't know their parents. I don't know their family. I don't know what they're like in front of like people off the internet. I don't know what they're like, but from what I know about them, I really like them and they seem like very good people. 
right? Ricky Gervais is obviously playing a character, but he's obviously also playing Ricky Gervais. But he's obviously not really the Ricky Gervais that you would meet in his home. He's obviously a different Ricky Gervais because we're different kinds of people in different kinds of places. Literally, I've had friends get offended at my work. You know, I've had people in my life get offended. My family and friends, of course, they're going to get offended at my work because they're like, hey, you're kind of mean about Catholics or hey, you kind of like make fun of religious people. And I'm like, yeah, they're like, I'm religious. So I was like, I love you. Suck it up. You spend your whole life voting against my civil rights. I can't make a fucking joke. Or I can't even be a little honest and say my life would be better without the religious, even though my family's religious. I'm not saying my life wouldn't be better without my family. I'm saying my life would be better if my family wasn't religious because I'm a queer person. And of course, my life would be better. I can't even tell my parents certain things without them freaking out. If I decide not to have kids, if I have an abortion, if I'm on birth control, all of those things will start a conflict. They do start conflicts. Of course, my life would be better if you weren't religious. My life would have less conflict. I'm not saying my life would be better without my family in it. Obviously, I choose to have them in my life. But obviously, my life would be even better without the religious part. My life. People don't hear when people, they don't listen. And they don't hear it within themselves. Ricky Gervais is obviously playing a character who's obviously playing himself, who's obviously still not the person he is when he's in the privacy of his own home. Obviously. And I have to say, it, it, it is disappointing because for somebody who is so intelligent, so erudite, and um, knows the power- So erudite of language, the power of words, to have become so basic and simplistic in his comedy is, is disappointing. Um, and it is basic and simplistic. And if you're talking Man, about she just talked mad shit on Ricky Gervais, bro. She threw mad shade at our boy. And that's what's funny. It's not our boy, like, slow down. But you know what I mean? Like, that's what, it's all high school with money, bro. Everything is just the same story over and over again. Oh my God, she threw shade. Oh my God, do you see the tweet? Oh my God, did you see that post they made? Oh my God, did you see the video they just made? Oh, did you see, what's her name? Who's this lady? This lady say this about Ricky Gervais. Okay. So, okay, thanks. Cool. You think I'm basic, girl? What are you wearing? I'm just kidding. It's cute, girl. You look cute, girl. I'm just kidding. About building bridges. If you're talking about bringing communities together, how- You can't. You can only build bridges with certain communities. The world will never get along. Listen to Auntie Brittany. The world will never get along. Grow the fuck up. You're not going to get along. You can't even get along with your friend. You can't get along with your neighbor. You can't get along with yourself. You think the world's going to get fucking along? You can't even get along with yourself. The only bridge you're going to build is the one where we decide not to hurt each other. And it's pretty good. But even that is overpromising. I promise not to intentionally hurt you. I do not promise that I will never hurt you. Because me being, me just existing can bring you pain. The fact that I just exist brings certain people pain. I do not promise that I will never hurt you. I only promise to never intentionally hurt you, to never target you with malicious energy, and to never try to hurt you. That's all I promise. Do not overpromise it to yourself or other people. It's the word I hate it so much. I hate overpromising. It pisses me off. I told my husband, if you marry me, don't overpromise. Don't tell me you're going to do dishes and then not do them. Just say, babe. My plan is to do dishes today. I might be too tired. I might run out of spoons. Great, babe. Sounds wonderful. And then when you do dishes, great. And then when you don't, I don't care. Don't overpromise. Just say what you're capable of. But people are so afraid of rejection, they will overpromise. This lady, she's right. In some ways, Break Your Gervais isn't going to build bridges because it was never going to happen anyways. You cannot build bridges with all people. Good people, perfectly great people, often don't get along. Why? culture, different expectations, different rules, different values, different bubbles. Different. Hi, Chris. Chris says, I'm a recent sub. Love your takes, Brittany. Hi, Chris. Welcome, welcome. How is it that you are basically poking your finger uh, at one particular community? And when you talk about, um, you know, making fun of, of sick children, of, of dying children, I just wonder how desperate you have to be to mm. do that. Hear, hear them out. What is this? Oh, hey, hey. Don't come for our lupus queen. This clip is in the context of an entirely different topic to Chappelle, but it shows the conversation around jokes and comedy. People are generally debating and negotiating that we just watch this. This we just watch this trend where we're like we pretend that 
that we don't know what a joke is. Like, this is not just him. This is happening in the world. Well, it's because some people don't know. First of all, neurodivergency is playing a huge role. Okay. Which is fine. That's not a bad thing. Sarcasm, different tones and inflections, different people. Like people cannot always tell when I'm joking. That's okay. I'll explain it to you. But the thing is, is they're not willing to accept that they might be the reason. When you hear people talk and you feel yourself getting offended, ask yourself, wait, are they trying to offend me? Because they might be. Some people are assholes and they're trying to offend you. Okay, I never try to offend people. I just try to be funny to me, which often kind of offends certain people, right? I don't actually want to be offensive to you. And if I was ever in your presence, I would obviously not do that. It's just when I'm in my bubble, I want to be able to be, I want, you know what I'm saying? That's the, that's the hard part is like, if I sit there and I say like, hey, the Vatican's fucking kids, am I right? Ugh. Some people are like, well, don't say that, bro. And I'm like, why? It's true. And so if I make a joke about Catholic priests, fucking little kids, it's like funny to some people, but to other people, it's like super offensive. You know, or all priests are doing, you know, I get it. I wouldn't go to a Catholic fucking church and make some fucking Catholic jokes. But in the group of my friend atheists, hello, fuck off. But also like there, people aren't going to take a joke as a joke the moment it, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying not to be offensive, but of course I'm going to be offensive because me just breathing is offensive to some people. So why are we pretending that like a joke is objective or people are supposed to know what a joke is when we don't even know what a joke is? What is a joke? What is a joke? What is it? What's this thing we we call a joke? What is it? We don't know what a joke is. Yeah. We don't. We don't know. We forgot. We forgot. All I can really say is that we are now in a social media age where the performativity... See how there's an expectation? We should know what a joke is. So I know what I think a joke is. Okay? I think I know what a joke is. But we might disagree on what a joke is. Kay's all caught up. Says, I'm all caught up. You're on fire, Brittany. Love the no BS calling out all these regulated... Oh, no, wait, regularized logical inconsistencies that go overlooked and unquestioned by those that don't know why they do stuff. Girl, let me tell you. But that's what I mean. I, I think to be more honest, the truth is, is like, I think I know what a joke is. I think I know when you're joking. I think I'm going to take you in good faith and assume it's a joke. Um, But obviously, like, maybe it is a joke and it's still offensive to you. Maybe don't watch it. But also, maybe we should do something about this person or maybe we should just not hang around this person, you know? of our online presence and of our social media personas is so conflated with real life that we can't and don't really want to distinguish between the two. The lines between the two are increasingly blurred and I think we are arguably increasingly incentivized to perpetuate this blurring because we can really quite easily or quite innovatively reinvent ourselves into things, into people that we actually are not. We're mm. all obsessed with authenticity, but clearly authenticity and being yourself gets you into a lot of trouble. So is anybody really authentic or are we just performing a bit? We're always performing. I really believe unless you are free to literally be so relaxed so relaxed that you can say everything unfiltered, every thought in your head. The problem is like to create an environment where you could be 1000% authentic, it has to be a very safe environment. Incredibly safe. Incredibly safe. And most people can't offer that to you and that's okay. When I say most, like when I say the only person on this planet that can fully see me is my husband, I don't mean it as an insult to my loved ones, obviously. I love my family and friends, but they cannot, it is not within their toolbox to give me a completely safe space. They do not and cannot access the tools to do that, which does not make them a bad person. It just makes us human. It's the complicated part of authenticity. The only person I can be completely authentic near is my husband. The only person and my cat that I can be totally authentic around is my husband, though, actually. But like, because he can, we can interact in this particular way more than even my cat and I can. Obviously, we can have conversations and other stuff, obviously. So again, it's because I let down every shield, everything around this man. It's disgusting. It's so beautiful. I love it. But I look at this person and I'm like, 
You know that that idea of like, here I am. Do you like me? Okay. I don't do that with people anymore. I just go, hey, bro, here's what I can offer you. Do you like it? No? Okay, bye. Just a part of me. When I go to my husband, I go, here's all of me. Do you like it, bro? And like he sat there and went, yeah, I like it. All of it. And I can talk to you about it. And I can have a conversation with you. And even the parts I don't really like, I kind of like because I can talk to you about them. Right? Authenticity isn't, people aren't entitled to your authenticity. Not even your family and friends. My husband and I have negotiated that and we want to have it with one another. But it's really embarrassing. And you say things that like, oh my God, this is why people don't share these things. Because like, oh my God, people go their whole marriages without sharing a lot because it's sort of like very hard to hear out loud. Like, oh, like, oh shit, that kind of hurts my feelings. But let's talk about why it hurts my feelings. And let's talk, we're, it's not for everybody. This thing that people want, I don't think they know what they're asking for. And I think it's really wrong to feel entitled to it in the first place. It's a very intimate process. It's incredibly intimate to have someone's authenticity, like fully 1000% unshielded. It is so intimate. The idea that you would give it so casually to the internet is just so ignorant of what it is. You don't even know what it is yet. You cannot know what it is if you want to give it to the internet. If you want to give it to your friends, I don't know that you know what it is. Now, can some of your friends and family have parts of you that are authentic? Absolutely. The parts of me that were with my fam family and friends, I try my hardest to be as authentic as I can, but even I can't. When my mom calls me, I goes, hey, how are you doing today? And I want to complain about my birth control, but I don't bring it up because she's, she's going to get pissed I'm on birth control, even though she knows. I'm not being authentic. Some of my friends I can do that with. Some people I can't. But again, it's not bad. It's just what it is. The issue is we hold on to this idea that it shouldn't be that way instead of radically accepting that it is that way. You're letting go of the idea of controlling somebody else. You're letting go of the idea that it was supposed to be different. It's supposed to be what it is. Doesn't mean you can't change things. But when you make an effort to change things, you've got to let go of the control of the outcome. You can only do your best and hope for something and then learn to accept what it ends up being. You know? Ren says, what do you do when you have to work with said person every day? You pull out a version of yourself that manages. Are you asking me that? I always feel like everything we're doing is about bringing out the part of ourselves that gets the job done, that is within reason, that is authentic enough and makes sense. Obviously, the version of me that's on the internet with you is like my authentic public self, Brittany, right? I try really hard to be transparent. I try my hard to do things um, in a way that's like within my values. I try my hardest to do, you know what I mean? Um, but you're not going to see every part of me, right? You're just not. Rightfully so. I don't want to see every part of you guys. I want there to be a healthy boundary, you know? Yui says, do you think there are ways to be authentic even in an unsafe space? I think there are versions of you that can be authentic in an unsafe space. You're just not going to be a thousand percent authentic. You're not going to be like completely vulnerable or completely um, open or completely, it would just be unreasonable. But I do think there's a version of us all that has been in an unsafe space and been authentically angry, authentically sad, authentically frustrated, authentically in conflict. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're humans. We're, our emotions are authentic. When we're, you know, we can have a, so, oh, let's, oh, this is good. Your emotions are authentic, but sometimes misplaced which in some ways makes them inauthentic, but they are happening, which makes them authentic. So sometimes they're happening, so they're valid, but they're not reasonable. So are they real? Yes, but also perception can help you change them to stop having those emotions associated with set actions, therefore not repeating the pattern. Does that make sense? So when people say your feelings aren't real, it's only facts, your feelings are real, but your change in perception can help you change the relationship you're having with those feelings. But that's why when the conservatives go, there is no depression. It's just the relationship you're having with your feelings. Cool. There is no reason to be anti-trans because it's just the relationship you're having with your feelings. But they are like, no, that's different. It's not. Not really. It's not really different. Being trans alone isn't enough for you to have a feeling of negativity towards it. 
unless you own a bias or a belief system that associates negativity with an emotion that you then project onto other people, right? Um, Thompson says, Brittany, do you think when we are triggered, we are being our authentic self? I think you are being authentically traumatized and expressing that trauma or you're being authentically in your trauma. I don't think you're your core self. So I think we're all, we all have like core selves, right? And I think there's a version of us that's the healthiest and happiest. And that's the most honest version of ourselves. The version of ourselves that's like all of the things at once, happy, sad, all of us at once. But I do think that when you're triggered or traumatized or in your trauma, you're the version of yourself that's sick, which doesn't make up all of you. It only makes up a part of you. And in that moment, you're that version of you. Does that make sense? You know? And I think that's kind of like the relationship we have to figure out. Yes, because a tiny contradiction of life. Life is such tiny little contradictions, huh? That's why, Jor like, that's why Jordan Peterson can have a career making fun of progressives for being sensitive while making a career about how he's sensitive about progressives. Right? That's why, you know, like that's all life is. And it's beautiful. And it's great. It's awesome. I can never ex escape the conflict I'll have with other people. We will always have conflict. What do we do anyways? Conflict is not the end all be all. I can have conflict with you and still find conflict resolution. I love you. I love you. That's what you're going to say to the people in your life, P.S. I love you. I'm in conflict with you. How do we resolve that? It's not about living a life or promising to people we will never have conflict. It's about saying, even though there's conflict, how do we find a resolution? I say I don't fight with my husband, which is true. That doesn't mean we don't have conflict. Sometimes we have conflict in regards to... Hold on. I'm trying to find one. We always struggle to find one. Um, oh, how I talk. Sometimes we get into conversations where there's conflict because of how we talk different. And he'll say, no, this is the answer. And I'm like, I just said that. And then that's conflict. And all of a sudden we're like, no, this is what we mean. Okay. So if we're talking about Luffy and we have a moment of conflict within the story, it's because we're communicating this part of the story different with each other. There's going to be conflict. How do we come to a consensus about it? How do we love each other through the conflict? And how do we make sure we do not hurt each other through the conflict? How do we make sure that our trauma isn't acting up? How do we make sure it's not an us problem? How do we make sure it's not us? How do we make sure? You know? Especially when you're a very analytical person, it's hard to say out loud, hey, I think I actually need to be in my feelings right now. Instead of jumping right to analytical, that happens to me. That's my problem. My problem is saying out loud, hey, actually, wait, before we problem solve this, I actually need to be held and told I'm allowed to be sad about this. And then we'll analyze it because I'm so used to jumping to analyzing. Everyone in my life is, is used to that. But sometimes I got to tell myself like, hey, be in your feelings about this for a moment and then we can analyze it. Right? But that's a me problem. That's a me problem. If the people in my life go straight to analyzing my problems because that's what they're used to and then one day I go, actually, wait, I'm crying now because I feel like you didn't appropriately react. It's because I didn't appropriately tell you, actually, this time around, I got to cry first. Then we'll analyze. That's a me problem. I did that. But nobody's at fault. Nobody's a bad person. It's a miscommunication. It's a conflict. It's a miscommunication. It's a conflict. Fishy says, how does one distinguish between healthy and unhealthy conflict and how to have healthy conflict? The difference is, is literally the intention of maliciousness. Are you actually trying to have the best result possible? Are you actually trying to be heard and yell at that person about your feelings? Are you misrepresenting the context of the situation? Like, okay, during COVID, two of my friends, bro, trauma dumped on me on, during COVID. And I said, hey, I love you both. You both need to go to a therapist. Something is going on and it's way above my pay grade and I cannot be your therapist because I'm your friend. And they were like, holy shit. They both went to therapy. It was the right answer. But because we're friends and we love each other, we were, you know, I was hearing them. I was hearing them. But then it started to cause a conflict, like a problem in our friendship. And I was like, and they were like, why don't you want to listen to me? Why aren't you like my feelings are hurt? Why aren't you? Because, dude, I'm not your therapist. And this feels like a therapy problem. So they went to therapy and it ended up being the right answer. 
So sometimes in conflict, you start to know it's unhealthy when there isn't a symbiotic relationship anymore. It's not working both ways. Something is wrong. Same with yourself. You can know if the thing you're doing is helping you by if it's bringing you joy. Something is wrong. It's not working, right? And you have to be patient enough to test things and to go back and forth. Like it wasn't the first time I started to feel a feeling that I told him to go to therapy. It was like the 10th time. And I was like, okay, I've tried this 10 different times. I love you. You got to go to therapy because I can't do whatever this is. I can't fix it, obviously. And my friends went to therapy and it works. So it's the thing I suggest to people often. Sometimes it feels like a rejection though. Your friend comes to you with their feelings. They're crying to you. It's emotional. And they're like, I want you to hear me. But I tell them I can't, bro. The way you're communicating is limited because I'm limited. And I, I think this is a deeper problem. And I need, I need you to figure it out because I, you know what I mean? And that, that's what it is. That conflict, healthy, means a sense of peace when you're finding the right solution. So healthy um, would be uh, well-intentioned, non-malicious, thoughtful, considerate, patient, kind. Unhealthy conflict resolution would be more like, we just don't have to talk about this. I'm blocking you. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Uh, we don't have to talk about this anymore. I don't want to hear about it. Versus saying, hey, it sounds like my mom and I, we're not coming to a consensus about the gay stuff. Let's not talk about it, but know that I love you and know that your religion and my beliefs, they're different, but hey, who cares, right? And then sometimes my mom goes, well, I really want to tell you about this thing though. And I go, I love you. We're not going to talk about it anymore. Because when we talk, it creates a conflict because of our difference of opinion. And I don't think it's necessary to have this conversation because you're not going to change on it and neither am I, right? And then she'll go, fine, if you're not going to change and I'm not going to change, why are we having the conversation, Right? The idea is like the conflict resolution could be something like we're not going to talk about this anymore and it could be healthy or we're not going to talk about this anymore and it could be unhealthy. And it depends on what you do in a symbiotic way. So if I say to my mom, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And then she goes, no, I need to talk about it. She needs to go talk to somebody else about it because I can't have the conversation with her. It's not symbiotic. But if she goes, you have to have this conversation with me, unhealthy. She needs to go talk to somebody else now because I can't help her. But if we come to the consensus, oh yeah, we're not going to talk about this anymore. You're right. We both agree this is bad. That's a conflict resolution. That's good because we both, it's symbiotic. And that works the same way when you're having the conflict within yourself. Fishy says, I don't know if you've made a podcast episode, but can you make an episode about introspective, introspecting on joy, making sure that you are following the joy? I do have a podcast on joy versus happiness. Have you seen it? Because I don't know if that's uh, along the same lines of what you're thinking. Uh, Brittany Simon, joy versus uh, happiness and not mistaking joy for something else. Mm, I think I do have a podcast on that. I think that podcast covers that. Check it out. If it doesn't and you follow up questions, I'll make a podcast on the follow up questions. OK. Oh, I hope that made sense. Thank you for letting me monologue, everybody. OK according to what is going to make us the most money, what is going to get us the most clicks, what is going to make us feel good amongst our tribe. For me, the point of Armageddon was to show that the more you know about a person, that is the more you know about their thoughts and their opinions, the less idealistic they inevitably become. But that this importantly doesn't make them less of a person. I do think we have forgotten this and I most definitely do not think that Ricky G Gervais demonstrated this point in the best way possible, but I can appreciate this sentiment irrespective of its execution. But I'd say that my takeaway from not just these three comedy specials, but from a lot of the viral and popular stand-up comedy today is that two things have replaced being funny for the modern comedian. For the so-called anti-woke comedian, being politically incorrect has replaced being funny. And for the so-called woke comedian, being oppressed has replaced being funny. In my opinion, both both groups of comedians have abandoned being funny because neither actually have to be funny anymore. Rather, both groups... Are I really feel like, have you guys watched like Carol Burnett or I don't know, just like go back, watch George Carlin. Like there's always been the controversial ones and there's always been the let's talk about how I'm a woman in comedy ones. And there's always been the like this is always been, this is not new, but they were funny. Like that's the problem. They were funny, 
but they're funny because they were relatable for the time. If you're not relating to the comedy, it's not going to feel funny. So it's more like, are they relatable anymore? And I'm sure there are comedians that are more relatable than others. You know what I mean? So I think the question we have to ask ourselves is who are people relating to and why? And if I'm not relating to them, why not? So are more interested in procuring the smugness and comfort of their fractured audiences. There is really no genuine pushing of boundaries. Like I kind of think if I went back and listened to Carlin or even Richard Pryor or any of those people, I'd probably find them still funny because I probably could relate more to them than current comedy. But that's because like it's nostalgic. It's a part of who I am. I don't really relate to the new comedy very much at all. But I love the old stuff. Like my my friends, my parents, we all used to watch the old stuff. It was so funny. The 60s and 70s. Oh, my God. Comedy was so funny. Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin and like family comedies were funny. But that's what I was raised on. So I actually, you know, I'm sure that would be very out of touch for a lot of modern people. You know what I mean? Like, but the comedy community is like, I love their podcast. Like I said, I think they're so funny. Like, uh, they tell some pretty raunchy jokes on the podcast. They're all funny. You know, they're much better than their stand up. Joe Rogan is so much funnier on his podcast. I don't like his stand up. I think it's so boring. So for me, like, it's also the delivery of the humor. I don't like the stand ups at all. I almost never like them. I don't, Andrew Schultz, I don't, Schultz, I like his podcast. I don't like his stand up. Like, I like his stand up. I, it's just, it's okay. I like his crowd work, of course. I like crowd work in general. But you know what I mean? Bren says, I think she's just not the comedian community. I've seen hilarious comedians in the past few years who are woke. I, IG, but very in real, um, IG, IG, what's IG? Woke IG? Instagram. What's IG? Um, but very, very funny. Yeah, yeah. I think like a lot of, um, I think a lot of uh, even quote woke or progressive comedians can be funny. Again, I like crowd work people. So people who do crowd work on TikTok, I think they're funny. But again, it's the medium in two in which you're consuming the comedy, right? You know? ...or taking risks in an age so lacking of both. Although I would most definitely argue that this is not the case in the real world. Based on social media and how social media plays out and characterizes people, it really feels like there is no platform for genuinely funny stand-up comedy. In this day and age, the stand-up comedian is forced to take a side and they will always choose the wrong side. And I think this current zeitgeist of very politically polarized comedy is why so many people have retreated back into the nostalgia of the comedies of old. Or they mm. simply haven't heard of contemporary greats like Jessica Kirsten, who noticeably attract a very diverse audience in age, sexuality, and race. If you're not she's getting funny. the message, I think you should probably watch Jessica Kirsten. She's pretty great. But right now, especially as it comes across on social media, stand-up comedians are increasingly talking to their audience as an identity demographic. And by identity demographic, I mean talking to their audience like a tribe of perfect tribesmen. Where are my peeps that are gonna get really offended if I do not offend everybody? Where are my peeps? At? The number of comments which I read which say something like, Ugh. I couldn't finish this special, so much boomer humor, eventually turned it off during her tirade about how kids these days are weak because they have food allergies. The underlying message of all these comments and things. It's just because you want to see yourself in the comedy like Kid said. She said Trevor Noah let the audience see themselves in the comedy, right? Is that this just isn't funny. And again, I will empathize with the modern stand-up comedian. In an age where there are so many identity groups and identity demographics, when there are so many tribes and tribesmen, in an age where humor and what is funny is so subjective and so influenced by a... Not gonna lie, that's how Brit talks to us. What? What? Wait, which part? What's her name? I don't even know what her name is anymore. Roseanne? What? Especially internet culture and its many different demographics and different subcultures. The modern comedian's job is harder than it has ever been. Yet, time and again, many prove themselves unwilling or just uninterested in taking up this challenge. And you know what? Like, I, I, I guess, like, in all essence, I can't blame them. I mean, they have to compete with AI comedy. I mean, who can compete with this? <laughs> You can't mess with perfection. 
In concluding, I think that it is very telling that every single article about Dave Chappelle, about Ricky Gervais, about Matt Reif, say the exact same things and use the exact same mm. buzzwords. Their mm. sets are either boring, offensive, punched down too much, or have just been done before. But I do feel that in every sphere of life at the moment, everybody's job title has morphed into telling their audiences what they want to hear, as opposed to telling them otherwise or opposed to addressing them objectively. And why I say that I see this in every sphere of life, not just in the life of the modern stand-up comedian, is because these critics and these journalists writing for their respective papers are doing the exact same thing. That is, they are just telling their audiences what they want to hear, what mm. will sell more papers or garner more clicks. Journalists from every liberal publication could not possibly acknowledge that there were inevitably some genuinely funny, some genuinely well-crafted jokes in an over one hour comedy special. Literally, they could not even admit that there was one. Instead, it feels like mm. everybody is either under pressure or either just decides to tell their audience what they want to hear about themselves and about the world or about whatever group is anti whatever they as a group stand for. Nuance and objectivity are lost in favor of the comfort in being bankrolled by the tribe. Chappelle, Gervais, and Rife do the exact same thing. The tribe bankrolls them. Ugh. Koi fucking bombed, bro. I hated every, I hated his delivery. I hated his style. Joy Koi, Joy Koi, is that his name? I hated everything about his, like, I couldn't even get through it, bro. The cringe was so hard, bro because they've distinguished themselves from the dominant tribe for understandable reasons, but nonetheless reasons that mean they fall into the exact same trap that they claim to be battling their way against. I think we're all reciting expected mantras to our audiences. And that doesn't just mean audiences on social media. All of us have an audience, whether that be at our job, in our homes, the exactly. audience of our partners exactly. or our desired partners. Exactly. Yes, kid. Mm -hmm. Our children. But I think we need to ask ourselves increasingly why we are reciting these. Let's go. The why question is where it's at. It's my favorite question. Why? expected mantras and I don't think we're asking ourselves nearly enough why this is. I would say that in this day and age we are reciting these mantras because it's just easier. It's not only easier in that it's profitable, but it's easier in that it's validating in a world where it is so difficult to mm. find validation. It is easier to recite than to talk to our audiences, honestly and objectively. What I see with the modern anti-woke stand-up comedian is another echo chamber forming in response to an echo chamber, as opposed to a resistance to the very- uh, which formed because of an echo chamber. We act like progressives came out of nowhere. Boomers gave birth to them. Boomers made progressives. They gave birth to them. They raised them. And then they're mad that they turned out progressive because they raised them poorly. But they raised them poorly because they were stuck in their own bullshit from their parents' issues. Like, y'all act like your kids just decided to rebel. Like, y'all didn't work hard to press them and tell them they were pieces of shit. And then they were like, hey, maybe the world should be better and people shouldn't be mean to each other. And you're like, where did that come from? You were a bully, mom. You were a bully, dad. You bullied us, bro. And then everyone's like, maybe we should be nicer to each other. Like, okay. And now, okay. It's a, just, okay concept of echo chambers as they like to claim. Gervais clearly has his echo chamber. Chappelle clearly has his echo chamber. Rife is trying but I would say at least at this point largely failing at cultivating a unified echo chamber. But no rock joy Joe is also my Croatia. What? I had honestly never heard of him until he dated Chelsea Handler. Same. And now I seem everywhere. Joe is my Croatia. I heard of him for the first time and now I seem everywhere. I swear to God. Same. Like, I was like, why are you, who's dating Chelsea now? And then, because I kind of, I used to love Chelsea. I've read her books. I was, like, obsessed with Chelsea Handler. I wanted to be Chelsea Handler when I was, like, 21. And I was like, I love her. She's, like, a goddess to me because she looks just, like, so interesting. And now I'm like, shut up, Chelsea. But I love her. I do. I will always love Chelsea Handler. But also, she's so invigorating. Like, invigorating? No. She's so infuriating. She's, but only because she's in a bubble. And the bubble is really annoying to me. Her choice of bubble where she landed is so exhausting to me. But genuinely... I used to love Chelsea Handler. 
I used to watch her show when nobody was on it and she had like Tila Tequila showing up and like nobody cared about Chelsea Handler and I was like I care and now it's like that's what you decided to do with your life bro she's the ultimate stay single woman live your life girl what do you need a man for they're not even that great except my man he's wonderful but he's a woman so it doesn't even count but fingers crossed, I guess. These echo chambers of the stand-up male comedian going through an identity crisis is fascinating. It's fascinating. Can you escape an echo chamber? Yeah, it's called popping a bubble. That's what popping a bubble is. It's just recontextualizing your perception of what you are consuming and regurgitating and assuming is the whole world. Like that's what an echo chamber ends up being. It's just a type of bubble. It's like what your bubble is reinforcing within you is being reinforced with what's in within you. When you change and you experiment, you become a person that like can't handle the echo chamber because you're like, wait, like this is starting to sound like I'm just hearing myself echoed back to me, literally an echo chamber. And I'm like kind of annoyed because like I don't hear myself talk all day. Like, what do you think? You know, what are you doing? What's your ideas? You know? because it does indeed appear very activistic in nature. But in all honesty, I would be very wary in seeing it as anything going beyond a different variation of self-commiserative navel gazing. But that's just my two cents. But please let me know your thoughts in the comment section. Let me know if you've watched any of these comedians, what you think of them, what you think of the state of comedy today, and whether comedy is something that you see as important or not. Thank you so very much for watching and if you like this video please consider subscribing and if you like this video and like my other videos then also please consider subscribing. It helps me out greatly. My goal this year is to get 200k subscribers and I would love it if we could do that together. You see this is my form of crowd work right here so please give me a thumbs up for effort. Thank you so much to all of my very generous patrons for your support. Let's go Kidology. Great video as per usual. Go leave her a like and a comment and a subscribe she's great her get let's get her to 200,000 subscribers let's give me I want to get to 5 million so just kidding like but you should subscribe literally subscribe but also like let's get her to 200,000 subscribers she deserves it not that anyone deserves anything but if anyone does it's kidology okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Then